Good afternoon. So, today, um, I'm just thinking back to what we've, we've been working on, and um, we talked um, about Darwell yesterday and the, the Corlett article, trying to make sense of retributivism, and we spent some more time on that um, Christopher Bennett article yesterday. And what I would like to do today, and certainly we can answer any questions you have from that material, um, or just address questions that you have as a result of your thinking about that material or what went on in class, please. please. Professor, sorry, before you start, yes. I, I would like to ask you two questions that I should ask you yesterday about the Darrow's article, okay. Darrow's theory. Okay. If I understood correctly, the second person standpoint is necessarily a moral point of view. Thinking the law as a social practice to regulate, to organize the human relations, the human actions, mm -hmm. it's possible to see, it's possible to comprehend the law through the second person standpoint of view. If the response is yes, the second question is, this is just a possibility to see, to comprehend the law, or this is the the better way or the uh, adequate way to comprehend the law through the second person uh, standpoint of view. Okay, so if, if I understand this correctly, we were talking about the, um, the second person standpoint being a moral perspective, uh, the relationships. Whenever people are in relationship with one another, they're in a moral relationship. Um, uh, they, uh, and, and, and this viewpoint aff affirms that. And your question really is going to the relation of that to law. Is this a way to comprehend how law functions through second person relationships? I mean, is that it? Um, well, we, you know, we said yesterday that um, ideally, um, th thinking about the moral life and what we decide for moral norms within a society, they should, they should ideally be housed, they should be um, put into law. Uh, in other words, law should reflect our morality, okay? Um, and um, it, it often does. I mean, it, um, even when societies do uh, terrible things, it's reflecting the moral norms that are observed in the society. I mean, the obvious thing to think about there is slavery, um, because we all, uh, as people of goodwill, know that slavery is an evil. It's, it's a moral evil. and. Um, It, I, there have been justifications for slavery. I mean, you can find some in the New Testament of the Bible, uh, justifications for slavery. Um, uh, what is it, the book of Philemon? Is that the one? A little, it's a one-page book in the New Testament where Philemon is a slave and uh, uh, um, he's running away and St. Paul writes a letter to Philemon, I think, he's, he's, I got this right, and tells him, go back to your masters. Okay? Now the reason he does that is because in the Christianity of the time, um, uh, St. Paul believed that the end of the world was coming. He believed Christ was gonna come again, and like day after tomorrow. And that's why he said, don't get worried about marrying, you know, and there's a context for all of those things that we read today and, and all of that. But, so it looks like there's a, a scriptural defense of slavery, and in the United States, prior to the Civil War, 
if you went to a church in the South, people would be in the pulpits preaching the, the godlike slavery. And those moral norms for that area of the country were um, very much expressed in law. We had fugitive slave acts and all kinds of things. But the, but the morality was off. It was supporting something immoral and the laws were reflecting something immoral. Now in an ideal system, we're, we're connecting good, positive moral norms with good, good law. Laws should reflect um, positive um, moral perspectives, right? There, there should be a congruence of those things. Um, but the fact is that um, moral reflection and, and moral thinking does not always conform to what winds up in a society's legal structures, okay? The, um, the evolution of morality can go, um, can move more quickly than what laws do and vice versa. I mean, that goes backwards too. And again, I would point to something in the United States about this that um, we passed during the 1960s, which we call our civil rights era, we passed a civil rights bill and a voting rights bill um, that were meant to address racial discrimination in the United States. And those laws were out ahead of where a lot of people were with respect to their moral norms. In other, in other words, their moral norms were reflecting um, um, continued racism, white supremacy, and all of those kinds of negative things. And the hope in those kinds of situations is that the law will become um, a standard that will then affect the moral norms. So um, up until maybe two years ago, I sort of thought that's what happened. And now in the United States, we have just all this racism and white supremacy unleashed in the country. So it makes me wonder, ah, maybe I've been wrong about how this works, but, but, but the, to your, your questions about the relationship of those things. And um, I, th I think ideally we, we want moral norms to find their way into law so that laws are upholding and supporting those things. And, and, and as I said, you know, we can find exceptions and we can find, um, um, some relevant perspectives, which is why I mentioned yesterday that um, um, when Martin Luther King was in the Birmingham jail, he, he mentioned that Hitler never did anything illegal. That the, you know, and I, that's a, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind about the law, that it does dep depend upon how the power flows and how the structures are put together and how government is constituted. And um, morality, if you, if you will, or uh, the moral vision of a society or of, even of individuals um, is often um, um, expressed in such a way that it is um, in defiance or in opposition to what are perceived to be unjust laws. Now, there were people who protested Hitler you know, we, we know about that, and they got killed because that's how they enforce things. But um, it's not like there was a lack of moral vision. It's just that the way the power flowed was so crushing and overwhelming with respect to opposition and with fascist ideas of government that opposition was simply stifled. In democratic societies, um, that kind of opposition is supposed to have voice so that we will work all the time towards laws that reflect the moral evolution that is going on in a society. Moral ev evolution is a reality. We used to have slavery and now we don't, and it's better that we don't. We used to treat women as second class sisters, uh, citizens and now we don't. I mean, I mean we do but we're not supposed to. The moral vision is, is out in, in, in front of that. So sometimes what happens is that we are able to make changes in laws on the hope that the legal changes will bring the rest of society along and help the evolution within society so that the moral norms 
um, that are changing get accepted by more and more people. It takes, it takes a lot of effort and, and sometimes a lot of time um, to change people's attitudes and um, to get them to, to see the point. If you're raised in a society where white supremacy is upheld, how do you get to a point where it's not held any longer? If this is what mom and dad taught you, and this is what you heard in church on Sunday morning, and they taught you this kind of thing in the schools, you got all of these messages about that, and you were brought up in this kind of environment, how do you evolve to a place where you can both say that's wrong and that we need laws to make sure that we protect people from these viewpoints so that the harm they cause does, um, you know, does not affect them or the, you know, the potential harm. So um, and a long answer to your question, but um, um, I, I think there is um, some kind of conformity that should take place um, ideally between these two two things, but but it often does not. And that, that's okay because um, moral evolution can take place. And if, if you believe in something like moral evolution, the thing you won't believe in is something like moral relativism. Okay? Um, if you think that it's better now that we don't have slavery and that we've made progress and advanced in a moral sense with respect to our uh, society accepting moral norms, you are not a relativist. You're saying that there, there are some uh, moral realities that we need to aspire to and they're, they're not just your society believes that, that society believes something else and who are we to make judgments about it. You don't get into that kind of a, a, a mess with it. So. So uh, it, does that get to your second question? What was your second question? Uh, is, uh, oh, okay, all right. Well, thank you. So, <laughs> so. other uh, comments or questions? In Lehigh Prison Project, did you see your volunteers or the working people in this project mm -hmm. having developed new ways of thinking because of the, their experience in the project? How was that, that interaction between? Um, I don't know that I would say new ways of thinking. What I would say is that they are having experiences, these are, these are students who are from 18 to 22 years old. So they're young people and they're having experiences like they've never had before. Um, when we have our information sessions about this, I always ask, have any of you, I did that in here. I said, have any of you ever been in a prison before? And um, quite often, um, somebody will say, well, yes, I have. And sometimes it's been to visit they belong to a church or, or some kind of organization that goes to visit a prison. And so they've been in a prison. And I've had people who've pulled me aside. Uh, I had, had a student, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, um, who pulled me aside and said, well, my father's in prison. You know, he's, he's serving um, a 20 year sentence or something like that. And, and uh, it really wanted to um, deal with that trauma in her life, I think by participating in something like this. I, um, so people have different kinds of reasons for wanting to do that. Um, a lot of people who come into our prison project, um, a lot of our young people, uh, come in because they're padding their resumes. You know, resume is, you know, you write down the things that you do. And if you put down that I volunteered in a prison, people will ask you about that. At a, at a job interview, um, if you go to a medical school interview, I've had students tell me this. I've had students say, well, I put this down. If I've had them, students who, that I have not had in the classroom who've asked me to write letters of recommendation for them because of their work in the prison project. Um, and I've done that. And um, so they, they, they do that. And when I, when I talk to them, I said, some of you are, are, are here today because um, 
you think this is really cool and you're padding your resume, you really want this unusual experience on your resume. And I always say to them, that's fine with me. I don't care why you're here. Um, I, I don't care what brought you in the door. It could be the most egotistical kind of thing in the world. What I do know, this has been a consistent experience for me, is that um, not too long after joining the project, they're sold. They have changed whatever it is that brought them in and they're looking forward to coming next week because um, they think they're doing something important. They've met someone who's in jail, who's in prison, and that person's in trouble and they are doing something to help them have a better life when they get released. And I think they, they feel the weight of doing something um, meaningful and something important. So um, it's not so much that their thinking changes um, as it is they, they're having an experience that they have never had before. There's something in them that wants to do that, that wants to have that experience. And I think they become reflective about it. I'm not quite sure, you know, five years after doing this, um, how their thinking has changed. My hope is that it has made them uh, more sensitive to the fact that um, there are people in the world uh, who, who make wrong choices and they're not bad people. Um, they're not evil people. They're not people who should be stereotyped um, as evil or bad or something like that. Um, you know, I, I was going on and on yesterday about there are evil people in the world. But uh, there's also um, people who wind up in jail because of making a very bad decision. And bad decisions are things that any of us could make at any time uh, on any day. We could, we could do something any day of our lives that could put us in jail, just something stupid. Um, um, a, a traffic accident where we're responsible for a death or I just, you know, you could just, it's, it's amazing we, we, we live as well as we do. Um, uh, but I, one of the things I think about Lehigh students, I, I, I think I mentioned to you, a lot of our students are, um, uh, they come from affluent, from well-to-do backgrounds. There's um, a good bit of wealth in our community and in our student body. And a lot of these young people, because of their family connections and things, are going to, um, they're going to have um, uh, lives where they're going to be in decision-making positions, right? And I, I hope that um, my, my vision for this is that I hope when they're, um, you know, 25, 30 years from now, when they're sitting around a corporate board making decisions about people who work for a corporation or something, that they will remember these experiences that they have and remember that they're dealing with real people and they will be sensitive to decisions and how it affects people and how their decisions can make lives worse and when people's lives are made worse, the kinds of trouble they can get into. So that's what my hope is for, for that kind of thing. And that, that's why we do it. Um, so, yeah, it's been an interesting experience. If any of you ever get a chance to, to go into a, um, a jail or a prison, um, you, sh you should go in and see, see what it's like. Um, I've, I've been hearing some things while I've been here in Brazil about um, even, even your local prison in Porto Alegre. And um, um, it sounds like not a happy place, but there are very few happy prisons. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. My question is about the last class. Okay. You said that science cannot define what is person because it's a moral question. It's a moral category. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is: If I have two, two or three concepts of a person, how do I decide which one is most appropriate? If you have two, two or three concepts of a yes. person. Uh, uh, I mean, you, uh, what are the criteria for correctly defining what a person is? Okay, that's a fair question, and it is a question that people have given thought to. Um, uh, uh, this question has come up uh, because of uh, uh, issues where personhood is at stake. And they come up at the beginning of life and they come up at the end of life. You and I are not concerned about each other's personhood. We just accept it, right? But we are concerned about um, um, a fetus because when we think about what we are as persons, we talk about our reflective capabilities, we talk, our ability, uh, talk about our ability to use language, um, to be the subject of experience. I mean, we, we can start listing criteria like this, and we understand one another to be persons because of that. And um, th this becomes an issue um, in the abortion debate because um, a developing form of human life does not have those personhood criteria instantiated, ugly word, but they're not, um, they're not realized, they're not um, actualized, they're not made real in the, in the developing form of, of, of human life. And as I mentioned, um, some of the people who've written on this issue say they're not really in place till um, a child's about two years old. Now, why is that relevant? Well, if, you're, if personhood is a moral category, okay, and you're not a person till you're two years old according to the criteria, then if, um, could you kill a one-year-old with impunity, without being punished, without doing some kind of offense? I mean, I, I mean we, 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 we charge people with a crime for, for killing a dog maliciously. So there could be um, a societal response to that. But if, in fact, um, the developing form of human life is not a person, um, it's exempted from a category like murder, um, where you would suffer the consequence of, of an int intraspecies <laughs> um, um, unjust killing, okay? So that's one reason it's, it's, it's relevant. And the other, the end of life, it comes up as well. If a person is, um, has been brain damaged um, uh, and uh, we think they're in a persistent or permanent vegetative state and they are never going to have the ability to use language to be in relationship. They've actually lost the capacity. See, the, the developing form of human life, we could say, make a case that it has a capacity and will grow into the use of that. But you could be at the end of life where something has happened uh, dramatically and um, terribly to destroy the capability. So it's never going to come back. Um, are you a person then? James Rachel says, you know, a person's biography can end um, long before their body ends. Um, so if you're not a person, you know, if, if the things that make you a person um, are things that is, are associated with um, neocortical upper brain function, not not the part at the back there um, and the bottom where it keeps your respiration going and your temperature, you know, and all that stuff, um, keeps your heart going. Um, but you've lost all of the part of your brain that we associate with you being a human person. Is there anything wrong in pulling the plug on you? We've had this issue come up time and time again. Um, uh, Karen Ann Quinlan was one of the first cases, and these are these are big cases in medical ethics and bioethics. And, and the Terry Schiavo uh, case was the big one back in 2006 is when I think she died. She had been in a permanent vegetative state for 15 years when the courts finally said you can stop hydrating her 
and you can pull out the feeding tube. And they let her, took her a week to die, but she did. But did, you know, did, was that any harm to Terry Schiavo? Terry Schiavo was gone a long time ago. When they did the autopsy on her, her brain was um, less than the size of a fist in, in just a fluid. And they showed these pictures of Terry Schiavo on television. Um, where a family member has got a balloon on her birthday and it looks like she's following the balloon and all that. And no, she's blind. She, you know, we had never seen before what a persistent vegetative state looks like. There are these periods of wakefulness unique to this condition that have nothing to do with being a person. They're, they're random. You know, if, um, if you went down to a, um, a gambling casino, okay, a gambling casino, and um, you start putting nickels or whatever your coin is into the, into the slot, you know, and you, 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 you do that, um, you could run through hundreds of hours of filming that, and then finally somebody clicks it right. Well, when I make my ad for my casino, I'm gonna use the little clip that shows somebody winning so that you will come in and put your nickels in my machine. And that's kind of what the Terry Schiavo thing was. Um, when they put the balloon in front of her, it was just a random happenstance when a balloon is in her face and she's looking around like that. But the question, is she a person? Is she a person? And uh, you know, ultimately the answer, I, I think because of the destruction of the brain was that she was not, because the courts would not have allowed um, the pulling of the feeding tube and all that. These are the kinds of questions you get into. Um, this is a philosophical question about personhood, but it's coming up in very practical ways in, in, um, in, the, in the medical arena. And, and, and then when you get to something like the death penalty, you, you have to ask a question, well, we're not really questioning whether this is a person any longer, by what right do we kill a person? Why do we inflict a punishment on this person's body when the moral center of a human person is, is a misuse of freedom? It has to do with decisions and the will and things like that. And we're going to destroy this person's body because of that? You know, I've, so all of these things um, come into play. It's a, it's a, um, it's a big question. It's a, um, it's a very serious question, and all kinds of people are addressing this um, issue in philosophical anthropology, but in very practical things around, um, this is one of the reasons, we, we, I have a, a colleague at, at Lehigh, a philosopher, who um, when she teaches ethics, she will never talk about the abortion issue because she says, oh, it's nothing but trouble. It's just a big, awful thing to get into. And, um, and, you know, and who would disagree with that? But the issues that are involved in it are so important because um, what you do when you get into the abortion issue is you, you do realize after a while that even if a developing form of human life doesn't actually claim to possess at a particular moment, like the fourth week of pregnancy or something, um, the characteristics, the criteria for being a person, we still, as a moral community, accept and exercise the power to confer on a developing form of human life um, personhood. So personhood doesn't depend upon actually um, achieving the criteria of, per, you know, using language, self-consciousness, self-awareness, interacting with the environment, all those criteria that we could come up with. And if you want a list of those criteria, um, Mary Ann Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N, is a person who wrote a famous article where she laid all that out. It's, a, it's an abortion um, perspective she has. Um, and I think infanticide is in the title of it, too. Um, but it, it, what it did was kind of open up the debate about those kinds of characteristics that we have as persons. Um, so, um, yeah, I, it, I, you know, even if you take a Supreme Court decision like we had in the United States, um, the Roe versus Wade decision, um, what, what Justice Blackmun said in that decision, I think this is quite fascinating myself. He said, uh, if the philosophers and the theologians cannot figure out 
um, when human life begins. And that, he was expressing that, I think, crudely, because we know when human life begins, and we can say things about that biologically. But he, he, was talk, he, he meant to be talking about personhood. If, we, if the theologians and the philosophers cannot come to agreement on what a person is, how can the court? How can the court take that on? He was saying, this is a philosophical issue. I gotta deal with the practicalities, and as a jurist, what he did was focus in on the thing that he understood, which was a fully endowed member of the, of the moral community, which was the pregnant woman. That Roe versus Wade decision is all about the pregnant woman. It's, it, there's a, tri, a trimester scheme set up and all that, but the trimester scheme is all set up around the health and, 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 and life of the woman. It's, and, and, and Blackman says this, um, it is safer for the woman to go through an abortion in the first trimester than it is for her to be pregnant. When you get to the third trimester, there is more danger in, in um, having an abortion than in being pregnant, and therefore, we don't want to subject the woman to that risk. It's all in the decision. People never talk about the, it's a, it's a really interesting decision. Um, what, what a jurist and what a lawyer has to do to start figuring out some of these things. But there are these provoked um, uh, philosophical questions about personhood that are, that are really quite important. So um, you know, stand by that. And I think they're important you know, when we think about punishment as well, because um, we're punishing persons. And what are we intending to accomplish when we do that? Um, you know, so we have, those are, those are relevant questions for us. So thanks for the question. Other, other things you want to? <laughs> well, I told you um, yesterday um, that I, I thought one of the things uh, we, we could do today is, um, because we have four classes rather than five, where there was something I really did want to get to. And so we'll, we'll, we'll start off and do it today and then see where we, where we are. Um, the writing that I have done that has dealt with um, um, punishment has basically been around the death penalty. Um, and I know that this is not necessarily your issue, this is not a part of your society. Um, more power to you, okay? That's what I say to that. Um, it is a part of my society, it's, it's something that I'm um, troubled by, deeply disturbed by. My goodness, we, we had a murder on the, the Lehigh University campus in 1986. This was long before I got there. And um, the, um, the young black man who com committed the murder of a wife was, was sent to um, death row. We had a student who be in my classroom sent to death row. You know, it, it's, um, yeah. We, we have the highest percentage, 2.3 million people, uh, highest per, per capita um, percentage of, um, of people incarcerated in the world up, up north in the United States and, um, um, and all of that. So anyways, um, the um, pr imprisonment and um, um, uh, uh, Things, things like the death penalty are, are realities that um, it's hard to escape. Um, you, uh, God, goodness. Yeah, anyways. Um, anyway, what I wanted to do today was to talk a little bit about um, the approach that I take to the question of punishment. This is a little seminar thing on, on punishment, and um, I thought I would throw my two cents in. And the, what I'm throwing in for reflection and discussion and criticism um, is, is not um, um, what you've been reading thus far. It's coming out of a, we've been talking about retribution and Kant, and we've been talking about um, uh, societal welfare and utilitarianism and John Stuart Mill and Bentham and people like that. Um, and we've we've mentioned um, contractualism, contractarianism goes by different different terms. We've we've even mentioned um, uh, vices and virtues, axiological ethics, Aristotle. Um, these are um, these are all important. I'm not trying to downplay the relevance or the importance of any of those perspectives. 
Um, but the, where I have come into this issue is around an old philosophical notion called natural law, okay? Um, you've, you've all heard of natural law, okay? Um, I don't know what you think about that or what you understand that to mean. Um, natural law has a long, long history. Um, it goes back, you can find it in the Greeks. Um, Cicero in, in the Roman era was a great proponent of natural law thinking. Um, and he, he's the first person who really articulated um, a, what we call today a just war theory out of a natural law perspective. Um, Natural law finds its way into Christianity. Um, Augustine does it. It gets articulated in a big way with Thomas Aquinas. And um, the angelic doctor has bequeathed to Western civilization um, natural law moral philosophy um, with it being kept alive primarily through the Catholic Church. Okay, primarily through the Catholic Church. Now, I'm a Protestant Christian, and I'm not attracted to natural law because it's Catholic, okay? So we'll grant me that. Um, uh, but what I find important in, um, in natural law is not necessarily um, its religious connections. Natural law is connected to religion in, in some uh, significant ways, and um, what natural law um, proposes is that, and, and, and this really is an old-fashioned notion, and in the era of postmodernism, this idea is, has been under constant attack. I understand that, but it proposes the idea that we have a nature, that there is such a thing as human nature. That's a controversial idea today, and you can attack that, but it seems to me that's right, okay? It seems to me that's right, that there is a kind of um, nature that we have. And what is that nature? Well, it's, it's tied up with the, with the idea of reason. So somebody who affirms natural law wants to say that um, there is um, an organization to reality, if you will, that we can discern that we can not only discern, but we can actually help create, if you want to get creative with it, um, through the use of reason. So um, the use of reason is what allows you to make inferences, which then allows you to think about things like proofs for the existence of God or something like that. What put everything in, there had to be a prime mover. If everything's in motion, something had to start it. Okay, that's just a logical kind of thing. But that's the kind of idea that, that, that comes out of a, a natural law thinking. And what I mean by natural law is, is not that um, natural law um, is simply generated by God. It's the idea that we have a common nature and that our ability to, um, to live and to discern moral reality and to flourish as human beings derives from our possession of reason. Now, you could say, well, God gave us reason. You want to explain the causality of all that, that's fine. Um, I'm not, I, again, I wouldn't take anything away from anybody who wants to do that. Um, to say that the, the origins of natural law are, are in, in um, the hands of a creator, okay? And I, I, I don't deny that um, that is a way to look at natural law, that, that, that God um, created reality in such a way that our reason can, can discern the regularity and the order of the universe and that our um, moral uh, object, is, our moral obligation is to follow that is to conform ourselves to, to what we discern. What I mean by natural law, though, is the idea that um, um, we have reason and we can generate um, a moral understanding in a large moral community um, by means of, of reason. Now, that's pretty simple, 
and uh, it, 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 it's, it's not getting into a lot of details, but where I go to look for an explanation of that broad generalization I just gave you is to a development in ethics that comes out of the natural law tradition. And I think it has wider applicability than um, what it's usually um, uh, thought to be. And th this is the idea of just war theory. Just war theory is a product of natural law thinking. Again, you can find it in Cicero, you can find it in um, developing in Augustine, and it comes into clearer um, um, uh, sight in Aquinas, and it is developed um, through the centuries. Suarez deal, dealt with it, I, all sorts of different people, and it's in use today. Um, in the United States, the military in the United States, cuts, they, they, they cut their teeth on just war theory. Um, when I've given talks on just war theory, um, um, in international conferences, the people who are really interested in it are Israelis, because they, they don't have a theory of just war. Um, they don't, you know, it, you know it's, um, it's, that, that's fascinating to me how you, you could think about that. But the idea here is that just war theory provides not only a, a, an example um, of, of thinking in a natural law tradition, it actually models it creates a model for how to think through any kind of a moral issue, any kind of a moral issue. That's my claim about it. So um, rather than just getting hung up on a big discussion about whether this is natural law or not natural law, I make a practical move and say, well, where does natural law find its expression? It finds its expression in just war theory, and I want to say that it finds its expression in just war, which is then a model for all kinds of other things. Okay, so I, I thought what I would do today is take you quickly through just war, and then um, I could take you through, um, your reading for today was taking you through an idea of just execution um, and just punishment. And that would be my contribution to the seminar, that this is a way to think about what a just punishment is. Um, it's something that is criteria bound. Um, so that's what my project is, okay? And you don't have to like this. <laughs> you may look at this and say, um, uh, you're not giving me any details. You're not really helping me. Yeah, that's true. The thing I like about what I'm gonna to present to you is that it doesn't have concrete answers about specific things. What it requires in order to work is for you to come into a dialogue with other people and figure things out. And what the, the theory is, that it, is that it structures, it provides a concern or a structural element um, related to justice that is to be debated around particular kinds of things, and I can actually give some examples of that. Now, where does this kind of theory begin? Well, if you've ever heard the idea of just war, you may think that's an oxymoron, that you know there can't be such a thing as a just war. Um, and I, I'm not far away from that perspective myself, okay? Um, I think if you use just war theory correctly, it is very hard to justify war very hard and almost impossible uh, today to do that. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, where does this theory start? Well, I think it starts with a use of reason. The thing that reason discerns in the moral structure of the universe, if you will, <laughs> is that there are certain basic goods that are not reducible to anything else. They are intrinsically valuable, and your reason and my reason and everybody else's reason discerns them as good. Now, we can have debates. Um, I'm a big Beatles fan, okay? Big Beatles fan. Um, you may hate the Beatles. More power to you. But 
even though we would disagree on the particulars of what kind of music you like, we both would recognize that aesthetic experience is important to our lives. That's what natural law provides. Aesthetic experience is a basic good. If you lacked the ability to um, uh, uh, have ex aesthetic experiences in your life, you wouldn't be recognizably human. They can be different kinds of things. They can vary culture to culture. There's no list of things you've got to do. But aesthetic experience, and we can find things like that. We can discern these goods of life. Life itself is good. Life itself. Life itself is a preeminent good. I would not argue that it's an absolute good because I think the value of life and the good of life can come into conflict with other goods. Okay, and sometimes it may be important to overrule the good of life for good reasons. But life itself is a good of life, aesthetic experience. Show me a culture anywhere, anywhere, that doesn't think that friendship and loving relationships are important to a good life or to the meaning of life. So we could identify, you know, eight or nine, and I've done these things, and, and um, you can find this in people who write um, natural law things. So um, when, we, when we talk about just war, one of the things we talk about is the idea of um, um, recognizing the good of life and the, the good of practical reasonableness. Um, we all know that, that ethics and thinking about what the good life is and what practical reason can provide with, um, with that moral point of view we talked about the first day. Um, that too is tied up with a, a, a good of life. Um, a life that was lived without recognition of practical reasonableness, without that moral point of view, would be horrible. We would be talking about people living in sociopathic realities without the constraints of, um, uh, of um, practical reasonableness. So. What does this mean in, in concrete terms? In concrete terms, it means that we begin talking about something like just war around an idea that all reasonable people should be able to agree with. Reasonable people of goodwill, okay? Remember that first criterion was universalizability? Well, this kind of, this, that's what we're talking about here. Um, all reasonable people of goodwill should affirm this. And this is what just war is built on. It's a very simple idea. We should not ordinarily use force to settle conflicts. That's it. Our reason tells us that ordinarily we should not use force to settle conflicts. You have a dispute over a grade, you have a dispute with a professor, professor has a dispute with you, you don't pull out a 38 and start shooting. You sit down, you talk, you negotiate, you, you know, you do all of these nonviolent things to work out, um, uh, you know, you've got a conflict and you want to work out the conflict, okay? You do not resort to violence, okay? Reasonable people understand that. That is the foundation of just war theory, it's very rarely ever um, articulated, but that's what it is, okay? We should not use force ordinarily to settle conflicts. Just war, as I'm gonna present it here, um, is not an absolutist view. We shouldn't, the reason I use the word ordinarily to identify this common agreement. See, reason is what takes us here. Reason takes us to this common agreement that I've articulated, that ordinarily we shouldn't um, uh, use force to settle our disagreements or our conflicts. Reason takes us there. That's our natural law connection, okay? Um, on the basis of that, we have to ask, well, there, are there ever exceptions to that? What if you're dealing with um, a crazy person who's got power and who will use force and destroy a lot of innocent persons? Well, again, 
Um, we want to think about negotiations. We want to think about um, nonviolent means of dealing with all this. And you come back and you say, yeah, but what about Hitler? Okay. Um, what about somebody who is just off the rails? Okay. So what just war does, it establishes some criteria that have to be satisfied if you are going to justify a use of force. And that's because this common agreement that we have is very, very powerful. We really should not, as reasonable people, use force to settle conflicts. But we have these criteria that if you meet them, you could say we have an exception here. We could use force here. Okay, and what are they? Well, the tradition, um, they've changed over the years. They've developed, um, I think legitimate authority is one that's been around for a long time. Just cause has been around since um, Cicero and, and um, Augustine used this, I think even before Aquinas. Um, but a, a just war has several criteria it has to meet. Um, that the use of force must be authorized by a legitimate authority, okay? Um, there must be a just cause. What is a recognized, widely recognized justification for using force? I, th that was justified, and you don't have to ask too, too far into it. What would be a widely recognized? Self-defense, absolutely. So if I came at you, you know, with a knife, and you um, deflected my knife, and um, maybe I got hurt from it. Um, you'd be using force against me, but we all say, well, good for you. Um, uh, you, you used force to protect yourself, and we, we acknowledge that. We, okay, uh, this, is, this is a reason-based theory, not a, um, an unreasonable theory. So just cause, um, self-defense is um, the, the the content for that, that we would actually, um, um, humanitarian interventions um, have been proposed for just cause. If you um, use military force to intervene in a, um, a situation where genocide is going on, um, is, that a is that a just cause? So they go on, um, a right intention and an ability to communicate it, the, the idea that, um, the United States um, Congress, our Congress has by the Constitution the um, power to declare war. A declaration of war is an announcement, of a, it's a communication about an intention to use force. Of course, we've been going to war for a long time without good announcements of our intention, but, but, um, but that's what that, that is. I mean, there are laws that, that have been written that, that govern that, but, but the classic piece that's actually in the Constitution is that Congress declares war, okay? That goes back to legitimate authority and then the announcement of what you're doing. Um, last resort, all that stuff about negotiation and nonviolent means, you should exhaust those. You do not use force as a first resort. It's a last resort. You have to have exhausted every opportunity not to use. It's that serious a thing. Okay, and this is the criteria that pacifists will um, focus on because pacifists will often appeal to just war as well. Um, um, actually, in some of my writing, I show how Gandhi and King, two well-known pacifists, make implicit appeals to just war all the time, all the time. Um, they don't want to set up a boycott in a city except as a last resort. Why? because it hurts innocent people. If I set up a bus boycott, it's gonna prevent all kinds of people. It's going to affect all kinds of people negatively, and I don't wanna do that. Let's go back and negotiate and try to get what we need worked out. Um, but even doing something like a boycott can be considered a use of force. The Satyagraha notion in Gandhi, um, you know what the translation of that is? Soul force. I mean, force is part of that. Um, it's putting pressure to effect um, an end. It's, it's, um, it is not violent in the sense that it's harming people, you know, physically and all that, but soul force is a way of putting pressure on. Um, anyways. Um,
you want to preserve values that you ordinarily that you wouldn't otherwise be able to preserve. So, what was at stake between Hitler and Nazi Germany and the rest of Western Europe and the civilized world? Well, there were certain values at stake that, um, if uh, Hitler were not resisted, you know, could lead to all kinds of uh, chaos and harm. You have to have a reasonable hope of success. You do not use force if you don't have a chance of, of using it successfully. If you're going to lose, you are not justified in using it. If it's clear that you, okay, it's you against 100 people, then you don't pull out your knife and attack them. There, there's no, that's crazy. I can't reason saying, come on. You know proportionality um, to the end of peace. What you're trying to achieve um, in, in applying just war theory is um, you want to achieve a, a peaceful resolution. You want to have everything restored to peace and you want more good to come out of this than, than ill. One of the problems a critics point out about um, warfare in general is that it's very rare that at the end of a war things are better than when they began. Um, so this is a, but it, it's something to pay attention to, the, the idea. So the, these are things that justify a use of war. The two up there where it says use in bello, in the conduct of, of war, um, you need proportional means. This actually is talking about weapons. So um, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons. This actually, this kind of thinking actually goes back to a medieval practice during, during warfare um, called well poisoning. Are you familiar with that? Have you heard about that? Um, if an army is going across um, a field and they come across farms and there are wells on it, what they will do is they'll take all the sheep and goats and keep going and, and when they leave they poison the well so that the, the, um, uh, the opponents who are coming up will come to the, to the same farm and uh, they're thirsty and all that and they're going to find the water poisoned. The, the reason this is immoral, okay, the reason this is immoral is that the war could be over three days from now and that poisoned well is going to be a poisoned well for a long, long time. So it's a disproportionate um, use. And, and this is the kind of thing that's pointed out about nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons. We can use them, but the killing effect of them lingers on and on and on. There were more people killed in Hiroshima from the after effects than in the immediate blast of a nuclear blast, um, the radiation poisoning that took place. Um, so weapons, chemical, nuclear, biological weapons continue to kill and exert a negative um, effect that is outside the bounds of the conflict. And for that reason, on just war theory, those weapons are not permissible. Okay, all right. Um, the, and the other one is non-combatant immunity. And um, what that means is it is never permissible under just war thinking to attack non-combatants, um, civilians who are not involved in the war. Where this gets tricky in the modern day um, is that um, when we have things like a war on terrorism, how do you know who the enemy is? When everybody was wearing uniforms and uh, you know, you're in blue and I'm in gray, we know who to shoot at. But what happens if the enemy is just civilian people working in a shop and um, they're likely to you know, um, use force against you? It becomes a tricky thing. But the idea is that you are not permitted to, under just war thinking, to attack known uh, civilians. And in the United States, uh, we lead the world, I think, in the development of, of armaments, and we have spent a lot of time um, creating smart bombs and things like that, you know, guided things that can go to a smokestack and right down a chimney and that kind of thing. The reason we do that is because of this. I told you our military cuts their teeth on just war theory, and the, um, the non-combatant immunity provision um, means that in order to confine the use of force, a use of a weapon to a legitimate military target and avoid civilian casualties means that you do everything you reasonably can do 
with your weapon design and development to prevent the killing of innocent civilians. Okay, so um, Saddam Hussein um, used to put military targets next to hospitals and schools because he believed that it would prevent um, Americans from attacking him uh, because of collateral damage, and the expectations of that. Um, so there are people who play off of, of this kind of thing. This is what just war theory looks like. You have to satisfy all nine of those criteria before you can claim that you are justified in using force against an enemy, okay? That's how the theory works. This is not telling you anything about a particular conflict. It's not telling you about World War II. Um, as a matter of fact, you can find wars that look like just wars, and then it turns out maybe they're not. Okay, there have been violations. And one of the things I would point to is um, um, the, the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, the bombing of Hiroshima was justified on purely utilitarian grounds. Harry Truman, who made that decision, made that very clear in his memoirs. Um, um, there were gonna be a million casualties um, if, if Japan were invaded at the end of World War II and he was told this bomb will kill 100,000 greatest good for the greatest number. A million's a lot more lives saved than 100,000. It's a simple calculation. And that's what he based it on. He said he never lost a night's sleep over that decision. If you're a strict utilitarian, you, that's right, probably not. Um, the problem is that on just war theory, which is a different kind of theory, um, what was attacked was a civilian center. Now, I've been to Hiroshima. I've actually been there twice and um, there, have any of you ever been there? There's a museum there um, that is about the um, military attack. And um, uh, I, was, uh, I was quite amazed to be in there because there's a lot of attention given to military um, targets that were around Hiroshima. Um, and it struck me that somebody's trying to create the impression here that this was a legitimate military target, when I think at the time it wasn't. There was actually an American POW um, camp in Hiroshima or in the vicinity, and there were American soldiers even killed there. But it, you know, it it it, it was a civilian center. It was not a major um, military target, and Nagasaki was uh, sort of the same way. And you could see the thing you do with just war theory is not only use it prospectively as you're thinking about using force, it's also a point of critique. You can use this theory to evaluate and, and judge things. You can say, did we respect um, non-combatant immunity? Did we try to prevent the killing of innocent civilians? Did we target civilians? Um, Winston Churchill, during World War II, um, you know, was advocating the carpet bombing of cities like Dresden um, in Germany, and he said, we're doing it to terrorize them. Um, Dresden was not a military target, but it was a major site. And the Allies during, it sounds like I'm beating up on the Allies, but, you know, I mean, everything Germany did was just, I mean, horrible. But, but we often think, well, we were in a just war. Well, just war theory will actually make you look at things and um, evaluate them in light of what the criteria are. See, there's nothing in those criteria that says anything about World War II or the Civil War or in, in America or any particular conflict. What they do is they establish um, justice criteria that you then have to apply to things. And it means that um, you have to come in to uh, debate with other people to figure out whether the empirical facts of a situation justify checking off those things. Be one way to think about it. Um, maybe not the best way. I don't know if it's really a checkoff system, but um, it, pr it provides a, a basis for critique. I think those criteria are very, very difficult to justify. 
in any conflict. And I have argued in my own writing that if you use just war theory, it will make you a practical pacifist without committing you to theoretical pacifism. A theoretical pacifist has got to deal with Hitler. What do you do about Hitler? You know, he was so evil. He killed you know, six million Jews. And I, how, how are you supposed to respond to that? I mean, even Gandhi, even Gandhi, he was approached one time about we should condemn the British because they're, they're attacking with violence and force um, um, you know, with, with respect to Germany. And um, even Gandhi says, we're, we're not going to pick that fight. Um, he had to recognize, you know, the, pacifism may not work in every situation. But um, um, I, th I think these criteria are very difficult to satisfy. The, the problem I have noted in the United States is that we do haul out these criteria when conflicts come up, and we sometimes just use a couple of them because they, they fit our purpose. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't have to say too much more about that, but, but, um, but that's what just war looks like. Now, my point in doing all of this stuff for you <laughs> today was to say um, that natural law produced this, natural law thinking produced this, okay? And it has evolved from when it was first put together and, and things like that. Um, and it's still in use today as you would expect it to if it's coming from a natural law perspective. Um, so it's still in use today. Um, it, it plays a large role in international relations and in international agreements having to do with, um, with conflict and warfare, okay? Um, but it come, and what I wanna say is that what you have in this is a model, is a model for dealing with moral issues, any kind of a moral issue. Some of this is controversial. Um, the, the first book I wrote using this, and I hadn't even figured out what I was doing yet, um, was a book on the abortion question. Because I wanted to argue, is there such a thing as a just abortion? Now, what's tricky about that is the natural law tradition comes out of Roman Catholicism, you know, in the modern world. That's where we know about it. But can you have such a thing as a just abortion? Well, the Catholic moral tradition would say no. You can't, be, be, what would a just abortion mean? It would mean that some abortions are permissible and some are not. And by applying the criteria, you figure out which are which. Some uses of force are permissible and some are not. By applying these criteria, you figure out which are which. This lands you in the world of moral problems, moral quandaries, moral dilemmas. If you're an absolutist on a moral issue, you don't have to worry about this. If abortion is murder, you don't have to talk about a just abortion. They're impermissible. There is no murder, murder and unjust killing that is also a just killing, okay? Murder is by definition an unjust killing. It can't be P and not P in the same respect at the same time. Um, you know, it, that doesn't work, okay? So if abortion's murder, it can't um, it be justified. If you think a woman has a right to do anything she wants with her body and pay no attention to moral issues around the fetus or something like that, you don't have a moral issue either. The only people who have a, a problem with the abortion question as a moral problem are those who don't know which abortions might be permissible and which are not. And um, pro-life in the United States, you, the, the movement of pro-life used to be um, even the politicians would say, well, there are three um, places where an abortion could be justified. Um, uh, it would be to save a mother's life, um, and in cases of rape, and in cases of incest. Okay, the relational violations that go on there are so serious and so severe that um, we could justify an abortion. That is not the Catholic perspective on this. Um, I'm, I'm acknowledging that. I'm telling you what the, the old view was in the United States. Presidential candidates who identified as pro-life 
would hold that there were a couple of conditions that would allow it. That's no longer the case. Um, it, it's very much a Catholic kind of pers perspective on the issue now. Okay, but but here, but that's what it is. Um, I, I like to think of this perspective as non-absolutist and um, morally moderate in the sense that some are and some aren't. So um, on the use of for some uses of force um, can be justified. Some uses of force cannot be. How do you know what the difference is? How do you get there? I'm saying look at these criteria and go down them and have a debate about it. That's what we do. Um, when the United States was thinking about going into um, the first Gulf War, the floor of the United States Senate was tied up for days disputing one point, which was have we given sanctions long enough to work? To, they wanted to avoid a use of force, and the debate was all about last resort. It was all about last resort. Reasonable people, you don't need this theory, okay? This theory, I think, is helpful. If you are contemplating, if you were elected to your Congress, and you were contemplating a use of force, you would start asking some of these questions. Well, we do, are we, do we have international law behind us? Do we have um, constitutional authority to do that? You'd start asking all of these questions. And uh, wh what is our cause? Um, what, you know, what kinds of things are at stake in this? You would, you, would, you would find your way to these things without somebody like me coming and say, well, there's a whole theory that you're following, okay? Um, reasonable people of goodwill will find their way to these issues and they will debate them. And what happens is you, had, like on the floor of the Senate, people will offer their perspective, other people will offer theirs, and you have to thrash this out because there's nothing up there about the Gulf War. There's nothing up there about World War II, about Winston Churchill or Harry Truman or any of those people. There are just concerns. We should not be killing innocent civilians. Are we doing that? Is this action that we're proposing going to kill innocent civilians? What can we do to avoid that? Okay, so you got the picture of, of kind of how this works? And that my point is that this is a model out of, of um, natural law teaching and natural law ethics that can guide our ethical thinking. And I've applied it to different issues. I mentioned the abortion issue. I've applied it to the death penalty. I actually wrote a book on the the death penalty using this, um, and you are getting a bit of that in, in this. Um, the, the criteria for just execution are in there. Um, what would an execution, um, what kinds of criteria would it have to meet in order to satisfy the moral requirements that would permit you to go ahead and execute somebody? Um, and I apply it to the idea of punishment. In other writings I've had, I've applied it to things like lying. Is there ever such a thing as a just lie? We have a moral presumption, a common agreement, we talked about this yesterday, that we shouldn't tell lies. Question is, can you ever justify a lie? Well, I think it's hard to do, but I think you can. You'd have to follow some criteria. What are they? Well, and I've done some writing where I've tried to show that. And it doesn't mean there are very many lies that you could um, justify, but um, if people are telling on average 200 lies a day, some of them have got to be justified, I think. <laughs> so anyways, um, that's the, the backdrop for um, what I wanted to offer in, in, in this uh, about um, just punishment. And, um, and um, so uh, we'll, we can spend a little time talking about that, but I I did want to just kind of stop here for a little bit and just ask what kinds of questions or concerns you might have about what's been proposed. Um, you may in your studies have come across just war theory, but you wouldn't have seen it proposed as a model for anything that goes on in ethics. And that's kind of what I'm proposing. But the part of it um, that doesn't get talked about is the common agreement up there. And I think that's what attaches us really in a deep way to natural law. That our reason 
takes us to a common agreement. Now, I, um, um, I actually was in a situation where I asked the question, do any of you disagree with this? We should not ordinarily use force to settle conflicts. And a guy raised his, you know, do any of you disagree with that? And a guy raised his hand and then people told him, well, he's a little crazy. And that would be the right response. Um, somebody who either for some reason doesn't understand what we're doing here or is just being um, contrarian, being kind of perverse in, in, in the situation. But reasonable people would agree with the idea that we shouldn't try to, we should not ordinarily settle our conflicts by using force. Okay. And, and pick your issue, pick your moral issue. And um, what we have to do is figure out what is the relevant common agreement that we can devise. And that can take some imagination and it can take a lot of hard work to come up with that. Um, they don't just present themselves. Uh, you have to think about how to articulate something that everybody can agree with. And you know, even to do that on the abortion issue sounds like it's silly, but yeah, I came up with something that I thought on the abortion issue reasonable people could agree with. I mean, it, and it had to do with you know we in valuing life we ordinarily should should not be having abortions. Okay, that sounds like it's a pro-life perspective, but the whole perspective was trying to move it over here, where you've got to figure out according to criteria whether any particular abortion is justified or not justified, or an execution, you know. That, that gets into a different realm because we wind up dealing with a, a, a criminal justice system. So, so anyways, do you, do you have questions or concerns or perspectives? We'll, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, the just punishment aspect of this. Because um, that's what we're here to talk about is punishment, but um, I'm, I'm throwing out at you a different way of doing ethics. This is not Kantianism. It is not utilitarianism. Um, it's not vices and virtues, but I would like to think that they all have a role to play. And, and um, something like last resort uh, or reasonable hope of success, you have got to project into the future. I think those are utilitarian in their perspective. So I, I do not acknowledge you are utilitarian in your perspective of this business. And then it's kind of suppressed. Um, it's hidden. But you need people of goodwill to be involved in this. And I'm serious about that. Um, uh, America went into Iraq um, in, in warfare in what, 2001 or two? I think it was 2001, it was after the, the, the Twin Towers came down, after the attack. Traumatic event in the United States. And uh, we, we began a war in Iraq and as that war unfolded, the justification, well, as the process of going to war unfolded, the justification that came forward was that um, uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. I don't know if you, this is, people are young, you weren't around, but it turns out that there were no weapons of mass destruction, which means that we went to war because our leaders told us that there was some kind of incredible threat to our national security and it wasn't there. Now, were they mistaken? They were at least mistaken. And people to this day say, well, they got bad intelligence. There are other people who say they just lied to us. They were so keen to go to war. And that's why I say the suppressed piece of this is really a vice and virtue ethic. It's a, it's a Greek ethic. In order to run this particular ethical perspective, you have got to pay attention to 
virtue. You need honest brokers, honest actors, people who come in to debate, who um, are willing to offer their perspectives, have their minds changed, but they've got to be honest people. And what if somebody lies to you? Um, if somebody lies to you and changes your perspective and gives you false information, you could wind up using this theory to justify unjust wars. I don't deny that. So even though it's suppressed, um, this kind of a theory depends upon um, um, the integrity of the people who enter into the conversation about the common agreement. We shouldn't use wars. You had a question, please. Uh, when we talk about uh, utilitarianism, we saw that we need a very powerful agent to calculate the ends. Uh, when we talk about that list, we ordinary ordinary people can create a list to moral dilemmas, or we're talking about uh, public situations. Because it seems that uh, we also need a very powerful agents to create uh, some list to resolve a uh, moral problem. And it can exclude some people. That using this theory would exclude some people? Is yeah, because it can re require, uh, require a lot of um, intelligence from the agent. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand that point. Uh, for example, uh, in the utilitarianism, we need a powerful agent to calculate the, the ends, right? Um, the, the, you're talking about powerful people? Yeah, uh, like very intelligent people. Exception, exceptional? Smart, smart people, intelligent people, okay. Intelligent people. Okay. Uh, we, it seems that we also need uh, intelligent people to create some list to resolve moral problems. Okay. And uh, exclude some, some of them. Okay. Um, so you're, you're offering a criticism of this perspective. Um, I just want to make sure, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's, um, it's a perspective on, on ethics and moral reality that depends upon um, uh, like an intellectual elite, would that be a way of saying it, rather than just common people? Yes. Okay, um, who may be people of average intelligence, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I, my response to that, I, I actually, I think that's an, actually a very good question, um, because the reason I came up with this, and this may strike you as really bizarre, given that you've asked this question, because um, I may have failed in what I tried to do. The title of my, the book that this came from is Ethics and Experience. And what I'm trying to argue is we need a theory, okay, that's the ethics part, that actually conforms to the experience that people have in the moral life, okay? Now, I will say that as a theory, okay, it's maybe an elitist theory, okay? Thomas Aquinas, Cicero, Kant, John Stuart Mill. I'll, I'll grant you that. But it, it, it is a theoretical structure that I believe can be applied to the way people, just ordinary, average, everyday people, you know, figure out how to live the moral life. Ordinarily, these issues don't come up. Why? Okay. Ordinarily, you don't tell lies. Now, that's a bad example because I told you this guy did research 200 lies a day, but I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to say, um, um, you tell, in your encounters with other people, you just speak the truth to them. Okay? It's rare. It's not impossible that it happens. And it probably does happen. Um, but it's rare that you are confronted with a moral dilemma or a moral problem around lying. And why is that? Because mom and dad taught you, your mother and father taught you to be an honest person. 
And you, um, when you were four or five years old, may have just lied to get yourself out of a situation and they found out about it. And maybe they sent you to the, your room, you know, maybe they did something else to you, but they punished you for it, okay? Um, but as a result of all that, um, as a result of your educational training, your, the parenting that you experienced, um, maybe you belong to a religious community where this gets reinforced. Um, your friends. Um, if you lie to your friends, they won't be your friends. Okay? If your friends find out you're a liar, you will be um, accused of the um, vice of mendacity. Nobody wants to be friends with a liar. You know, even criminals, um, criminal gangs don't want lying within the gang. You know, uh, that, you know, okay. Um, so my, my thought here is that um, this kind of a theory, yeah, it's an elitist structure. I'll, I'll grant you that. But the point of it is to say it's pointing us to a reality, which is that ordinarily you are living in the wake or under the light of that common moral agreement. You don't resolve conflicts by hitting somebody. When you get in a conflict with somebody, and that can happen any day of your life, it can happen with your spouse, it can happen with a friend, it can happen with um, the, the person you go to buy gas from, you have a dispute, I gave you a 20 and you only gave me, you know, change. you can get into a dispute. You don't use force to settle those conflicts. You live out of the common agreement. The rest of this thing only applies if there's some kind of a problem that, ar that arises, okay? Most women who get pregnant are thrilled to be pregnant, okay? The only kind of pregnancy that is of concern to a just abortion theory is a pregnancy that is not wanted for some reason. And it might not even be the, woman, the pregnant woman who doesn't want it. Her life may be in danger. The government may be telling you that we're only allowed one baby in this country and you're now, um, it's the government who doesn't want it. Is that justified? Well, plug it into the theory. Who gets to make the decision? That's one of the criteria, okay, for a just abortion. Who gets to make the decision? You have to figure that stuff out. This is meant to guide you through um, a dilemma that you may have. And my case is that you actually do this. You may not think you do. And it's, it's not like, you, you know, Nobody's ever heard of me and this theory, okay? It's not like, oh, the Stefan ethic, you know. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that when you have a moral dilemma or a problem that you're facing, because you're a reasonable person, it's the natural law thing, because you're a reasonable person, these things will come to mind and you will address them. You will, um, uh, you will, you will ask how, um, I tell the truth all the time, but now I'm in a situation where I may have to tell a lie. Can I justify it? And there's a good chance that you won't be able to. You'll go through these criteria and you won't be able to justify telling a lie. You may be in a situation of conflict where you don't want to use force. You might go through these, these criteria and you can't justify using, a force, using force. And that, you shouldn't use it. And even if you do find yourself at the end being able to justify a use of force, it doesn't mean you have to. You still have a decision to make about that. So I, I actually, I, I do appreciate your question. Um, I just need to tell you that the project that I was involved in with this was, was not meant to be um, an elitist project, totally divorced from the lives of ordinary people. It was actually designed to do just the opposite. It was designed to take the ordinary experiences that we have around um, uh, moral problems that arise and explain what those look like and what they are and what goes on in them. And um, again, they're, they're guides. And I think if you were facing a moral dilemma of some kind around um, some kind of issue, you would wind up making an appeal to these things. 
and you don't need to read me on this. You would just come up with them because you're a reasonable person. You know, I use this kind of thing in medical ethics issues all the time. Um, um, should a, a physician help um, a patient commit suicide? Physician-assisted suicide, you've heard of that? Well, ordinarily, no. And we've got all kinds of reasons for saying that. But in the United States, we've got a couple of states who actually made some provisions for that. And they've used this. The lawmakers actually used a method like this. If you go into the um, Oregon uh, Death with Dignity Act, it's on, online, and look at it, there are, if you count them, there are 72 different conditions that need to be met. Okay? A justified use of physician assisted suicide. Okay? Well, in Oregon, there are not seven criteria, there are actually 72 that have to be satisfied. They're thinking this way because reasonable people thinking about this issue, they want to say, um, ordinarily we shouldn't do this, but there are situations that arise. There are situations where a condition is terminal, the person's going to be dead in six months, they could be facing intractable pain. Either intractable pain, pain that really cannot be addressed adequately through, through medicine, or if it is um, done that way, we're putting a person into basically a coma where they have no relationship with others. So maybe that's a moral problem. Now we need to think about criteria. So, so, so that's my response. It, uh, it, it's an excellent question. Um, I take the force of it. Um, but I, I do want to say that um, the intent of this project is actually to give voice, theoretically, to what I think all of us do in one way or another when we're trying to think, think through a moral problem. It's just that, ordinarily, we live out of these common agreements, okay? We don't lie, ordinarily, in our encounters with others. We don't... Um, um, uh, you know, when a, when a woman gets pregnant, um, she greets that with, with joy and happiness. That's what we want to have happen. Uh, when um, uh, we're thinking about different kinds of issues, we live out of the common agreement. Uh, that's, where, that's where we live. And um, um, that's why that part of the theory is so important. And the fact that just war over the years has suppressed it and not allowed it to have voice, I think, has been a real problem. So. You know, we're at 3.30. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we should, um, would it be a good time to take a break? Okay, we'll take, we'll, how about if we take a little break? Um, we'll come back and talk about, the, the, the just punishment thing is simply another application of this. As a, as a method, we'll, we'll talk about that. If you've got questions and concerns, we can talk about it. If not, we'll, we can move on to something else. But again, what I wanted to do here today was give you the model and explain the model, and then we can, um, um, it has relevance to the issue of punishment. So, okay, we'll take a break. So after all that, um, uh, turning to, um, the topic of our seminar, which is punishment and, and moral obligation. Um, this kind of a theory would locate um, the obligations we have um, in, um, in reason, in coming up with reasons for action. And I think um, uh, it's not articulated, but it, it's something that would uh, assume the presence of a moral community and the obligations that we have toward one another to be using reason to interact with one another and uh, figure out the, the good, the right, and the fitting thing to do. So um, op moral obligation on this kind of a theory um, uh, moves back into the idea that the moral community is comprised of persons of goodwill who can communicate with one another and can express um, uh, and communicate um, their goodwill to one another. Okay? Um, so, um, the, the question that, that comes up, I said this is a model, 
So um, the model can be applied to all so sorts of things. We're trying to here um, apply this model to the question of punishment and ask instead of what's a just war or a just abortion or a just lie or a just this or a just that, what is a just punishment? What would that look like? So in order to do that, um, uh, uh, we have to articulate um, a common moral agreement. And um, in the reading you had for today, I did that somewhere here. Um, the common moral agreement that we have. <laughs> I'm looking for some italicized um, language in the actual article. This, this article I, I gave you, um, it's, yeah, in the readings I gave you, it's actually on page uh, 162. Um, what is the common moral agreement that we would come up with in thinking about the issue of punishment? And this is what I came up with. Now, I should say that when we articulate a common moral agreement, this is my articulation of it, and you throw it out there and maybe you see a problem in it I didn't see. Great. Um, it's revisable. If you can figure out a better way to do it, um, a, a more inclusive, um, a crisper way to do it, I, um, please do that. Um, if there are things listed in the criteria that you think are not being addressed, you could add to it, you could take away from it, you could think about this. This is not written in stone. This is the idea that reasonable people of goodwill are trying to figure something out and they're trying to create a structure of moral meaning. And we have to work at that. And you could believe that this is handed down from on high, um, but when we've had things handed down from on high, um, there are things like, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't covet. Okay, I understand that, but are there ever exceptions to that? Um, that becomes one of the questions. You know, if you, uh, I, I sometimes read to my students from, from a Bible in class where um, um, there are certain statements about um, uh, something like the, the commandment that you, you shall not kill. And you can find like um, 10 verses below that where there's an authorization to kill, okay? So, so then you have to ask, well, what does all this mean? And it becomes one of these questions of interpretation. The moral presumption, the common agreement that is relevant to the issue of um, punishment, um, I articulated like this, to pursue the goods of life in a way that leads to human flourishing Human beings are obligated to respect one another, Kant, and order society in ways that promote peaceful, responsible, and harmonious relations with others. Okay, there's the language of obligation. There is the language of um, responsibility. There is the language of har harmony, harmoniousness. There's an end being sought um, around punishment. This is not saying we should only punish criminals. Or, that's not what the common agreement is about. The, the, um, the common agreement that we have around the death penalty is not we should have a death penalty, we should not have a death penalty. That's not the common agreement. People disagree about whether we should have a death penalty or not have a death penalty. That can't be the common agreement if people are disagreeing about it. Okay. So what is it? Well, the place we can all come together is on the idea that the state should not ordinarily kill its citizens. Anybody disagree with that? See, that's where no hands go up. But yeah, okay, yeah, we don't want the state ordinarily to kill citizens. And then you have to ask, well, are there ever occasions when the state could? I can think of cases where the state could kill a citizen, you know, bank robberies taking place, 
and um, the state intervenes because the person's holding a hostage and they, they call in um, a team and um, um, you know, maybe the bank robber is killed in, the, in the settling that conflict, force is being used there. Um, but the state there is, um, is, is killing a citizen and can it be justified? They're trying to save other lives and you can go through a whole analysis of that, but, but that would be a situation where um, um, I think you could come up with that. So the question then is, if you can think of some examples where the state can kill a citizen justifiably, um, what about the death penalty? Is that one? Okay. And my analysis is that if we lay out the criteria for just execution, you have real trouble justifying execution. As a matter of fact, I wind up concluding that execution is immoral because it violates so many of the criteria. I actually think it violates all the criteria that I identify. If you know anything about how the death penalty works and how an execution power works in a society, um, it violates all those criteria, okay? So, um, like I say, this kind of a theory can provide um, a forward-looking justification for things, and it can also provide a kind of backward-looking critique that allows you to criticize um, um, particular kinds of actions, okay? So, the understanding here is that um, we want to pursue the goods of life. We've talked, that's the natural law appeal here. Um, we want to promote human flourishing, and in order to do that, see, there's nothing in this statement about punishment. Okay, but punishment is relevant to this because we are obligated to respect one another. That has something to do with punishment and order society in ways that promote peaceful, responsible, and harmonious relationships with others. Nothing in that about punishment, but that is, I think, and again, you're free to disagree with this, but um, of course you are, but um, the idea that punishment um, plays a role is relevant to this statement. We can use this as the starting point to think about punishment and what a just punishment would be. We want a just punishment to promote peaceful, responsible, and harmonious relationships with others. We want society to be ordered. We want people to respect one another. Okay, so that's where the theory begins. And then the criteria that get, um, that get put forward, what have I got there? I've got nine criteria, but the, and they, they, they do follow here. You know, the punishment and uh, sentencing of offenders must be legitimately authorized. We have in the United States a whole history of something we call vigilantism. Um, this is when um, sometimes an individual, but sometimes communities take it upon themselves to enforce a community standard of some kind. And one of the places that um, this happened a great deal was in our southern states when um, African American males were lynched. Um, they were hanged um, and often set on fire right in the town square in front of the courthouse with the town sheriff or marshal looking on. Um, be, and these were often accusations about a black man uh, raping a white woman, um, which often wasn't rape but might have looked funny at or, or something. I, who knows what some of those things are about. But it was a way that a community would uphold its own white supremacist standard against uppity blacks. And that's the way this turned out to be. And this is saying, if, if punishment and sentencing of offenders must be legitimately authorized, there is no legitimate authorization in a bunch of vigilantes getting together and killing somebody um, as, a, as a punishment. Things have got to follow procedure. Um, there needs to be yeah, under our constitutional system, something like equal protection of the laws and due process of the laws, okay? 
So when you've got due process and equal protection, um, you can find legitimate authorization, but you don't just get a bunch of your friends together and go out and kill somebody or punish somebody for something you think is wrong, okay? Um, so legitimate authorization, it's important. Uh, there, number two, there must be a just cause. Again, we see this in just worth it for inflicting a punishment, which is to say, the offense must be sufficiently grave that society itself is aggrieved and the community well-being is adversely affected. If you're going to institute a punishment for someone it's, and, and do it with legitimate authority, there has to be some evidence that the community itself is concerned. So when there's um, you know, serious property damage, when there's um, um, tort damage, you know, injury to people, when there are killings that go on, this, this affects not just the victim and the perpetrator, but all of society is affected by things like this. Um, so there's gotta be some kind, uh, this way of constructing the theory says there's gotta be um, um, an offense of sufficient gravity that society itself is feeling the effect of that. Number three, the motivation for punishment ought to be justice, not vengeance. Justice is broad and impersonal. Vengeance is personal, right? Vengeance is um, um, people seeking revenge are doing it out of a, a personal um, energy, okay? Um, and, and the the justice constraints are meant to be brighter, broader and wider. Uh, yes, please. When do, do, do I know when the motivation is just or not? Because I don't have access to the motivation or intentions. When do I, do I know when, when the motivation is just or not? How, how, how do, do you, I know? How do you know? Yes. Um, well, that, that's a, a good question. What I would say is that what this, this you're not gonna like this, but what this theory is saying is that you can't let it be vengeance. You've gotta let it be a concern for justice. So um, it means that, um, You know, you could I, you, maybe you could apply the um, the universalizability notion here and say something like, for anybody, anybody similarly situated who has done exactly this kind of thing and is coming from a background like this and all that, that this is the kind of punishment that um, you you should impose here, and you should not let a desire for personal vengeance. Um, um, uh, affect what you're doing. Um, so, see, due process, would you have a fair trial? If you got accused of something and you went to trial and um, there was a person you harmed, um, how would you feel if you found out after you were convicted that somebody on the jury um, was a relative of the victim? you would feel that you didn't get a fair trial, right? Um, and you would, you would feel that way because that person could have been using uh, something other than um, impartial justice. So vengeance, I think, is a challenge to the idea of impartial justice, okay? Vengeance is not Justice is meant to be impartial, and vengeance is not. Vengeance is personal, you know. Um, uh, in my quest for vengeance, I might try to get on the jury, get you, you know. So those kinds of things don't really happen, I don't think, so much in the real world, but that would be, when we write our screenplay or our novel, we could do stuff like that, okay? But uh, fair question, good question. Um, Punishments must be distributed and administered fairly without um, focus on race, religion, sex, class. It's an administrative issue. Um, but this is also equal protection and due process again. It's an equal protection notion. This is um, when we inflict a punishment on someone, we don't want to say that you are more likely to get, um, because you're black, 
we're going to um, impose the death penalty, and we're going to do it more frequently because you're black. I, I did have some, um, I don't know if you noticed some of the statistics in here. Um, what was the Minnesota thing? Um, if I can find that real quick. Uh, but what was it in Minnesota? I'm forgetting what it was right now. But in Minnesota, the you were like, uh, uh, I can't find it. Maybe it's um, between 1980 and 1990, drug arrests and imprisonments of blacks for drug offenses in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, rose. 1,613%, resulting in a 58% non-white prison population. And um, I, there's a, I don't know, I can't find it right now. I thought I had marked it. Um, but in Minnesota, there was um, a bizarre statistic about um, um, if you were black, you had like an eight times or something um, greater likelihood of receiving a harsher prison sentence or something. The, the point of that is that um, uh, some of these characteristics um, that you would take into a courtroom, you know, we always have justice is blind. There's always a blindfold around justice. Well, it turns out justice is not blind. That if, um, if in death penalty cases, race of victim is a, a leading statistic to indicate who gets the death penalty. Um, um, if, you, if, if you kill a white person, you are many, many, many times more likely to receive a death penalty than if you kill a black person. Um, there have been some adjustments to that over the years, but um, when I started doing some of this work back in the 1990s, um, I ran across some statistics that were true at the time. They're not true now, but but going back to, um, oh gosh, 1660 or something in the United States, there had been only um, four or five people in the history of the country for like 300, 400 years, who, 300 years, who had received an execution for killing a black person, and a couple of those were slaveholders who beat slaves to death, and other slaveholders were so incensed that they would destroy property like that that they, they wanted the, slave, the other slaveholder to be executed for it. Um, but if you, so there are things like that, but racial discrimination takes place, and one of the places you look for it um, is, um, in, in the race of the victim. The, there, if you're interested in death penalty things, there is a website um, of the, oh gosh, what is it, the National, um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but the National Death Penalty Center keeps statistics on all of these things, and they have statistics on race of victim, and um, um, the discrimination that goes on in the imposition of the death penalty is, um, it is still remarkable to see. It is still remarkable to see. Um, and it goes on, you know, in, in, and, and not only in going before a judge and a jury, but some of these decisions, some of this discrimination that goes on is decided at the point where um, a prosecutor will say, we're gonna charge this individual with this crime. Or a police officer says, I'm going to pick up this person. So I'm on a college campus. And I have told you, we have a lot of um, students who are pretty well-to-do financially and all that. Well, they get in trouble for um, offenses with respect to drinking, public drunkenness and things like that. And um, they will sometimes, um, they'll get their names in the school newspaper and have to go before a school um, um, judicial thing, you know. But um, they are sometimes people who are um, breaking laws. And our police officers at times will not 
push um, to get them involved in the criminal justice system with an accusation, they will kind of protect them from that. So they're a college kid at this university and will kind of protect you from that sort of thing. Whereas if there's um, a person from the community, um, a young person, a, a teenager who gets picked up for um, public drunkenness, and maybe this person's Hispanic. We have um, a lot of Puerto Rican um, folks who live in um, my, my, my town. Um, that person could wind up in jail that night. So it's a disproportionate, it, it comes down to even who a police officer will charge with a crime. And the discrimination goes on and on through the system, okay? But that is not a just punishment. If those kinds of factors are coming into play that is not impartial justice, going back to our original criteria. Um, punishment and sentencing, the fifth thing, must express cherished values and seek to restore peace and harmony, going back to the um, moral presumption, the common agreement. The point of a punishment should be to restore harmony in the society and hopefully harmony between the offender and the victim. So this kind of a theory is set up for restitution. It's set up for restorative justice. Um, but, that, but it's articulating an end. We want to create societal peace. We want to create harmony. Harmony is when things are working together. Uh, okay. Um, sixth, punishments ought not to be cruel and, and dehumanizing. And here, but should observe the law of parsimony. Um, if you don't have your, the, the law of parsimony basically says, um, with regard to punishment, that you want to impose the least harsh punishment. Now, in societies um, where uh, policymakers and politicians want to prove themselves harsh on crime, they will say, we need harsh sentences. The law of parsimony says you want the least harsh sentence imposed on people. Why is that? Well, um, there are lots of people winding up in prison today because of drug offenses, okay? Um, they're, and they're possession offenses. And um, if what you do is impose a harsh sentence through mandatory sentences um, and, and, and three strikes laws, things like that, um, you could be taking a breadwinner out of a family and creating an even more um, serious poverty situation for a, a family. And if a judge um, can use discretion in a case and say, you've broken the law and you're gonna owe me 50 hours of um, community service, I can impose a punishment on you and, and intrude into your time and, uh, you know, and, and explain that we're uh, um, responding to an offense, but we're doing it in such a way that we're not ruining your life or the, the people who depend on you, okay? When we just take a person who may have a family um, or different kinds of responsibilities and take them out of society and put them in prison um, um, to show that we're tough on crime, we are creating havoc. We're, we're creating um, a terrible situation for the people who um, depend upon this person or who could depend upon this person. And the idea here is that um, if we want to restore people to their rightful place in community, we do not want people to serve long, long sentences for crimes that may be relatively minor crimes in the grand scheme of things. Um, okay, so the, um, um, we're looking for peace and harmony in society and 
Again, putting a person in prison for a long time is not, uh, again, if you know anything about prisons, it is not a good thing to do if what you want them to do when they come out is be a productive member of society. Um, you, the longer you're in prison, the more things you have to do to survive in prison. And um, uh, it, it winds up being a very uh, difficult and, and terrible experience for people. Um, so the law of parsimony is, is a, um, it's a, it's a reducing down law that instead of um, let's be as harsh as we can, the idea is let's um, um, use the least amount of um, coercive force and do alternatives to imprisonment, alternatives to punishment, and um, a just punishment would, would try to do that. Um, the seventh criteria, um, punishment ought to be a last resort. And what I mean by that, um, it, uh, that may be expressed um, inelegantly. Um, I mean, even if you tell somebody that they've got to do community service or something, that can be a punishment. Um, but it should, the idea here is that you want to um, um, address the victim, you want restitution, you want the offender to provide apology. Um, uh, there, are, there are things you want from this, but um, putting a person in prison, subjecting them to an actual punishment ought to be the, the last resort, okay? Um, the number eight is punishment ought to restore a value equilibrium distorted and upset by the wrong. When you offend and do something wrong to another person, um, the, the harmonious balance in society is upset. A victim is caused to lose something and the perpetrator um, in taking something that's not his or hers could actually gain something. So there's an upset. And the question is, how do we get this back in place? And again, this kind of a theory is saying that um, there's been this distortion. We need to work to get it put back in order and find ways to do that. So the restorative justice movement that's underway in a lot of communities today, um, and it's often starting at kind of grassroots levels, um, uh, it is meant to address things and create alternatives to, to prison. Um, number nine is punishment policies must observe a principle of proportionality. Um, and this is um, a notion that's taking account um, of the fact that um, sentencing, the sentencing of, of offenders ought to demonstrate a willingness to mitigate, sent make sentences um, less harsh by taking into account both social injustices and personal circumstances. So what we're asking there is for the conduct of the judicial system, and I think this is mainly through judges who have to hear these cases and decide these cases, um, to use discretion and to use um, some sensitivity to the kinds of backgrounds that people are bringing into um, the courtroom uh, and to, to make sure that punishments are proportional to, to the offense. So those, and I, what happens in this, this piece that you read, and um, I, I do quote Anthony Duff in there. I, you know, <laughs> I had forgotten all about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, but these, these criteria create a picture of what um, a just punishment would look like. These are the kinds of things that would come into play. They're guidelines. They're not telling you about any specific crime or any specific punishment, but it's saying these are guidelines that um, c can be used to set up um, uh, responses to offense, um, to offense, um, to criminal activity, to harms, to torts, as we say in the law. Um, and this is what the, um, um, the picture looks like. So it's modeled on that. 
and it's 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 um, it's pushing the punishment system um, in in a particular kind of direction, um, supporting efforts to to institute restorative justice, um, and it's saying that that's what we ought to be about. We want to create harmony within society. We want to create uh, harmony and balance um, through um, uh, offender and victim. The disproportionation, of the well, um, the the upset that has been created between victim and victim and offender needs to be brought back into balance. Okay, so if there is some way that we can deal with these issues. Um, short of imprisonment and, um, uh, you know, the idea ought to be to keep people out of prison rather than filling up the prisons. We have so many prisons in the United States right now that um, uh, there are corporations that are creating private prisons that rent themselves out to the states uh, so that the states um, will, will send inmates to uh, these prisons and they're money makers because they charge the state so much per person per bed and they make a lot of money from the states. It costs sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year um, to keep an inmate in prison, which is um, which is equivalent and actually at sometimes in some states that's even higher than the average um, uh, income for a family to keep one person in prison. Well, so there are all these resources being directed there, and um, rather than diminishing our prison population, there's been an effort to increase it. Um, and it's, it's a money-making proposition um, for a lot of people. A lot of people invest in it. So, so that's what, I, we don't need to go through, I mean, you, you had the piece to read. What I wanted to do was to give you some background on where a theory like this even comes from, which is, natural law, the just war thing, to give you the model, and then say, here's how it applies on the punishment front, which is our, our topic here. But the, the idea of the common agreement that we share is taking into account that we have obligations towards one another, we need to treat each other with respect, we need to create a societal harmony. So you can find Kantian things, you can find utilitarian things, you can find vices and virtues running through through all of this. So it's, a, it's a, an inclusive kind of um, theory. It's, and, and, and you can say, um, and you could legitimately say, well, it's incoherent because you can't be a Kantian and a, um, a utilitarian in the same theory. Why? Well, a, a Kantian says you don't pay attention to consequences. That should never be what determines what you, you, why do you do what you do? The great ethics question, why do you do what you do? A Kantian says, because the moral law demands it. I have a duty to obey the moral law, okay? It's intention, my intention must be clean. And so the front end is what's important. You go over here to a consequentialist, a utilitarian, why do you do what you do? because I anticipate and foresee the consequences and more good will come out of it than harm if I do A rather than not A, okay? So you've got somebody here who's saying, um, my ethic is non-consequential, and you've got somebody here saying, my ethic is consequential. How can you have them in the same theory? Well, it's incoherent. I'll grant you that but they're both covering important parts of how we live the moral life. Um, I'll bet very few of you um, live the moral life as pure Kantians or pure utilitarians or even pure virtue people that at different times in your life around different decisions you have to make, you make them um, on the basis of different things. They can be justified. I mean, the, the action will be a moral action, um, but you can't always justify it by one theory or the other. So um, you're in a situation where you tell the truth, and sometimes you tell the truth simply because you're an honest person. 
Mom and dad made you that way. They made you to be a person who told the truth, and it was reinforced by all kinds of things, as we talked about, your schools, your, the, your friendships, your communities, your religious communities, blah, blah, blah. So it, it, you are an honest person, and we know that your honesty is a part of your character, and that's why you tell the truth, okay? There are times when you puzzle a little bit about, gosh, should I tell the truth here? And you go, it's my duty to tell the truth. I don't really want to, but I'm going to tell the truth. So you're a Kantian when that happens, okay? You're going to do your duty to tell the truth, okay? And sometimes you really do think, you know, more good would come out of this than that. And um, lying's a, a troubling thing because, like I, you know, we said yesterday, a, a utilitarian can't, you got to be smart and you can't always foresee the consequences. But if you, if you decide to tell a lie on a utilitarian calculus, you have to weigh in that what will happen if it's found out that you told a lie. Um, because if it's found out that you, you could have very, very serious consequences. So that's why um, when you start the weigh should I tell a lie, should I not tell a lie, on the basis of your outcomes, your utilitarian consequences, um, most times you can't justify a lie on, on that kind of basis. So however you came, character, um, duty, consequences, all three of them are going to tell you, tell the truth, okay? And that's what you do, but in different situations, you may be conformed to one theory over another, but they all come into play if we start analyzing. We'd have to know what the, situ tell me the situation, explain it to me, and then I'll tell you what theory applies, okay? What's important is that you tell the truth, <laughs> okay? That you do what is morally appropriate um, will catch up with the theory. I need to know more about your motivations or how you're thinking about this or what the challenge to you is. Okay, so, so again, um, this kind of approach is, is saying that there can be Kantian aspects to it, there can be utilitarian aspects to it, there can be virtue aspects to it. Um, they're all a part of it. Um, and they come into play in different ways and sometimes they come into play specifically around criteria, around particular um, issues like last resort or something, where you are having to, to, to address this in kind of a utilitarian way. The moral life is complicated, okay? Telling the truth moment to moment is not complicated. We're not, I don't think we're offered challenges all the time not to tell the truth. We, um, these, these theories come into play as we're confronted with um, dilemmas and obstacles and problems, and that's when this comes into play. Um, right now, there are many societies that have problems with criminal justice, and this kind of an approach to criminal justice that's emphasizing returning people um, to society as productive members who are not um, resentful about the criminal justice system itself is a challenge, but um, anyways. That's what um, the theory looks like, okay? Um, are there questions or comments that, please? Well, uh, I'd like to know about this concept, reasonable people of goodwill, mm -hmm. uh, if there is any relationship with the idea of John Rawls' uh, personhood, the idea of the good, the ways of ability, if there is a relationship with these reasonable people of goodwill and the concept of justice or, or personhood in John Rawls. Be between a reasonable person of goodwill and the yeah, con and, and, concept. And the personhood uh, of John Rawls uh, about uh, Raisability, idea of the good, the personhood, the injustice, uh, and the theory of justice of roles. There is uh, any kind of idea of good, idea of justice 
It was a PDP. I, I think so. I think there is a connection between them. Um, um, I, th I think when Darwell's talking about the second person business and the obligations we have toward one another, um, that there is a, um, an expectation that in the moral community, um, we relate to one another as people of goodwill and um, expect that out of others, okay? Um, now, um, somebody could be a wrongdoer, you know, somebody may have some kind of um, um, want to involve us in doing something wrong. They, they want us to help them steal a car or something and um, come to us and ask about that. And um, the question would be, well, do you, what, what are your obligations to somebody who is asking you to do something wrong, you know, and, and I don't think you have an obligation to do something wrong, but it doesn't mean that um, you discount that the person who you're in relationship to in this is somehow just outside the moral community as if they're not, as in that article yesterday, the Bennett thing, one of us. Uh, there are people who are not one of us, and it may be because of psychopathic things. They're, they're, they really don't connect to what we understand. Um, and, and in the moral community, there are people who fall short, who, um, who offend against, against the norms of the moral community. And in um, responding to them and addressing them, even addressing their offense, it can be done with respect for the person. And that's why the punishments that we want to think about should not be overtly or overly harsh. Um, because what we want to do is make easier the effort to bring in a, a person who has offended back into the community. The, the problem is that we, we don't make it easy. Um, I, I don't know what the situation is in Brazil, but in the United States, we do not make this easy. A person, you know, I mentioned this yesterday, but it's very hard to pay a debt to society and, and move beyond. It's the, uh, the, the application where you've got to let people know that you were a felon. It's, um, you've got to report into a, an, uh, an officer of some kind. You know, you're released from prison, but you need to check in with um, um, a parole officer or something. You know, you're getting out of prison two years early off of your sentence, but you've got to check in with a parole officer for the next 10 years. Um, you lose your right to vote. I mean, if you're convicted of a felony, you lose your right to vote. You lose your right to vote in the United States, it's like, what kind of a citizen are you? I mean, that's, it defines you as a citizen, your right to vote. Um, and, the, the, you know, and the question always is, um, are you, as a person, equivalent to the worst thing you've done? People do bad things, and some people get caught for it, and some people don't. Um, and, um, geez, I mean, you know, do, does, your, does your life amount to the worst thing that you've done? Do you always have to pay for the worst thing you've done? Um, are you treating a person with respect if you can't let go? That, that, that thing we looked at yesterday where we're not going to pay attention to the history of your criminal activity when we evaluate you in this trial or this thing, um, that's a pretty radical idea. It would be in the United States um, that we're not going to take into account your criminal record because bringing your criminal record just gets you more years added on. You know, you're an habitual offender. We, we write laws that, that put people away for life um, ar ar around their criminal record. Their criminal, you can't get free of it. And, you know, we talk about um, punishment as paying a debt to society, right? And the question is, when is the debt paid? You know, when is it finally over? When can you just be free of all that? And it, I think it's one of the reasons, it's one of the things that contributes to high recidivism. Um, 
the, the idea that offenders will re-offend. Um, it's just the inability to get free of the, the system coming after them. So the, the idea is that in the moral community, we can treat one another with respect. And the question is, how do we respectfully punish you if you've offended? And the idea here is that a just punishment is going to try to present you with the least harsh thing that's proportionate to what you've done. And it would, it would look towards um, an end of reconciliation. If there are ways to avoid the justice system in some ways, I mean, there are, um, I have a, a friend in Nashville, Tennessee, who from, I think I mentioned this, but he, he ran a, um, a community restorative justice center so um, people who um, got involved in some kind of a conflict, the judge would say, let's send them to the center and see if they can work this out. So there's a mediator there, and the mediator puts down the offender and the, um, um, the victim, and they, they try to work out a solution. Now that's treating everybody with respect. These things don't always work and they wind up going back to court and there could be big fines, there could be prison or jail time or something. Um, but um, um, it's, it's an attempt to, um, to address the problem and address the difficulty created by an offense and treat everybody, including the offender, uh, with respect. You know, and that bec that becomes the, the big issue. So the, the again, the answer is that um, um, the the second person community that we've been talking about does um, allow for an offender to be treated as a person and to be treated respectfully as a person, even though they they have been an offender. Um, so that's just punishment um, on this kind of model would be arguing for that. It would not be arguing for, let's impose the harshest, harshest punishment because it'll prevent more of these kinds of things from happening. I don't think deterrence really works as, as a, an incentive for a criminal activity. Uh, again, I think most people who engage in criminal activity, um, we talked about this in the context of murder, but it plays out with a lot of them. They don't think they're gonna get caught. They think they beat the system somehow. And in a lot of cases, they do. And there's a reason they hold that belief. Because they, you can beat the system. You can avoid the police, and you can avoid jail. So that's just a, that's just a reality. Yeah. Other, other questions or comments about this piece of things? Please. Professor. I have a question. When in the history of law the class of class, when discussed of Italian law. I, I didn't I, ah, I, Italian law. It's Italian. Oh thank you. Uh, but, sorry. Retail retaining of law. Italian law. Okay, I for, uh, re retaliation. Yes. So I, I, I'm not clear about what your question is. Um, in my uh, in my class of history of law, when I discussed the Italian of law, the lady Italian. Yeah. Ah, and the question of the discretion of judges when the situation of the judge of became the Italian. Um, If I understand, the question is uh, the, the law, 
I for I two I for two. Yes. Uh, with this law, the judge has discretion, discretion right. or just uh, decide uh, based on the literally of the, this law. Okay. okay. Um, well, I, I, it's different in different places. Okay. Um, um, the, the problem I'm raising around this issue is that um, there are efforts underway, some of them successful, to take away the discretionary power that, that a judge could have. And I think that's not a good thing, okay? Um, discretionary power means that a judge can look at you as an offender and get a report on your background, the kinds of obligations and responsibilities you have for your family, for the income that they have, things like that. And it could affect how I think about, if I'm your judge, I could affect how I think about your, um, uh, your, your punishment or our legal response to your offense. And um, again, I think putting discretion in the, and you, can you have bad judges? Oh, yeah, yes, you can. There can be horrible judges, but it's also a really awful thing um, to take discretionary power away from judges. Um, see, part of the, part of the reaction um, to, that three strikes laws and uh, mandatory sentences, <clears throat> the reason we got those is because um, a lot of people, this is about the United States right now, a lot of Americans thought that um, we were not being tough enough on crime. And, um, oh God, these things wound up in, in presidential election campaigns. Um, in 1988, when George Bush, the first George Bush, was running for um, president on his own, um, there was an ad put out um, about his opponent, Michael Dukakis, who was the governor of Massachusetts. And it was an African-American man who had been released from prison early. He went out and re-offended. He, I don't think he killed somebody, but he, he raped somebody. And George Bush had this black man on the ads, um, and this was saying, Michael Dukakis is, is weak on crime. And there are people who think that those kinds of ads help George Bush beat Michael Dukakis. Because at one point, Dukakis was actually ahead in the polls. Okay? Um, so it's the perception in society that um, there is um, too much um, liberal, um, um, I don't know, what, what do you want to call it? Um, uh, laxity, it, it's, we're not strict enough with offenders. We need to be harsher towards offenders. There's too much um, um, letting harsh, hard criminals get off um, and not pay, um, uh, you know, not, not um, you know, serve harsh sentences and things. The funny thing about that was it was also very clear that Ronald Reagan, as president, uh, when he was a governor of um, uh, California, had also released people under those laws, and he had people who had reoffended. But you know, you know, no system is perfect. No system is perfect. If you have a system where you're trying to put people out of prison, um, is everybody going to just go back and be a happy, normal citizen? Nope. There are going to be people who reoffend. Uh, recidivism is a reality of criminology and of. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a part of the system. That's that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so so that, that that's that's what happens. Um, the idea of putting mandatory sentences. 
um, for crimes means that the judge's discretion is taken away and for the judge to obey the law, it's all the judge can do is hit the hammer on the, you know, hit the gavel on the table and say, you've got to go to prison for 20 years. The, the judge happy about that? No. Okay. Judge is not happy about that. Um, uh, I mean, there could be cases where they are, but um, they're always things. But but it's taking it's taking discretion away, and the, the 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 problem is that there are all sorts of implications for this that that feed out into society, the um, the community from which this person came, the kinds of responsibilities that hang on this person. Um, and sometimes these offenses are not, they're not violent offenses. Why anybody is in jail for a nonviolent offense, I don't understand. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, that's kind of the way that goes. Of course, in China, you know, we were talking, and there are white collar criminals in China, depending on what it is you do, who wind up getting executed. Um, they, they, they look harshly on, um, <laughs> on um, crimes like that, so nonviolent crimes. But in, in our Western systems, I don't quite understand why a nonviolent crime would, um, would meet with a, um, you know, a sentence like that. Yeah, I, I, I talk in here about the Enron case, if you, if you caught that. That was a major financial scandal. And um, they wound up putting um, um, a couple of the people responsible. For, one of the major people actually died of a heart attack in the midst of all that. But they put some of those people in prison. But they allowed the families <laughs> of, um, of some of the people who were involved in this um, incredible situation where people contributing to their retirement funds and stuff lost all of this money and these uh, corporate leaders took this money now they got caught and it was a big scandal but they never were asked to pay that money back to the people they took it from they just took these people and charged them and you know and put them in jail and the families of these people have got the bank accounts where all this money is, is, and you ask, is that a fair and equitable and just thing? Um, uh, why any of that funding should have been kept by um, people who, who stole this from other people? See, there wasn't a restorative piece to that situation. And um, it, it, was, it was just a horrible failure of the criminal justice system to bring justice and fairness when so many had lost things, uh, lost you know, incredible amounts of money. They lost their whole retirement. There were people who lost their whole retirement package um, as a result of the Enron scandals. And, um, um, and the families of the corporate Enron people um, have the bank accounts for their their loved one may be in jail, but they can still live a pretty good life off of what was put away. I, it, yeah, so these are the kinds of things, you know, white collar crime becomes a, um, you know, a pretty serious thing too. But it didn't do any good to put those people in jail. You know, those people should have been out there making money to pay back all the people that they took money from. So. They should have figured it. Yeah, we just haven't figured out how to do this, <laughs> so, which is unfortunate. Other questions or issues? Please. Uh, my question would be uh, if you are taking a moral look point of view in the nine criterion to, to the just punishment. The moral point of view the moral point of view. Relevant, explain this again. So I got the moral point of view. I just had some trouble hearing you. Okay, uh, in the nine, the criterion number nine of your just punishment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are you taking a moral look point of view? Um, does it conform to the moral point of view? Is that the, is that? Yeah, uh, if you are 
um, punish people uh, taking into account uh, things things that they didn't have control, like uh, social economic uh, backgrounds and mm -hmm. everything else. Yes. Because taking uh, this and like it, it seems like a moral like, defender, uh, judging people accordingly, uh, unlucky, bad luck. Okay. Well, it, it, it's. I would think it's some kind of question about fairness, right? Yeah. That um, um, if a person has experienced great disadvantage in a society and the society um, hasn't provided opportunity, um, should that affect how um, a punishment is meted out? You know, and I would, I would go back to um, to the Les Miserables case with Jean Valjean. Um, why was he thrown into that prison? Do you know, do you know Les Miserables? Yeah, the movie and all that. Uh, a great, it's a great story. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous story. But he, he's thrown into jail, um, into this uh, incredible imprisonment experience, right? Uh, because he stole some bread. He broke a window. And why did he do that? He was starving to death. So you can raise the question about what kind of a society allows a person to be on the verge of starving to death, breaks a window, you know, breaks a law to take some bread to eat to, was he guilty of a crime? Well, in a formal sense, yes, but in a moral sense, there was no crime involved in that. You have an, a, an obligation, I mean, if you're a, um, I mean, you can do this under, under Kant, on utilitarianism, on anything, but you have a prudential um, obligation to protect yourself, okay? You have a prudential obligation to look after yourself. And if you're starving to death and the only way you can survive is to eat a piece of bread that is behind a window and you break the window, um, in order to get some bread to survive, um, um, that that's a morally permissible thing to do. Morally, the law again, we have a distinction between the law and morality, and the 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 law has not caught up to the morality, and it raises bigger questions about what kind of a society would allow something like this to happen. What kind of a society would allow a person to be starving to death? Okay, um, I, those are important questions, but they, they do, I think, make some kind of connection, some relevant connection to the idea that you've got to pay attention to a, a person's situation and their background. Um, because what, you know, the book, Les Miserables, was putting French society on trial and found it wanting. That story is a, is a criticism of the France of Victor Hugo's day. And it, um, it had a, the impact of that was so powerful, we were still talking about it. We're still talking about it. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great example. Um, I mean, there are, there are wonderful things in that book, you know, with the bishop's candlesticks and forgiveness. We have all of those different things we can uh, haul up. But, but the, the impetus for that story was a person starving to death. And the, and the law and the society totally failed that, that man, that, that person who was starving. And what kind of an obligation did the society have to that, um, to that man? And what kind of an obligation did the law have um, when this starving man was charged with a crime that was no crime, that was, um, that was the enactment of prudential reasoning, okay? You know, if somebody walked in here and uh, threw a hand grenade right there, um, maybe one of you uh, in an act of super arrogation would jump on it and, and all of that and sacrifice your life for the rest of us. But um, I'm heading toward the door, and that's what you should be doing too. There, you are not obligated to jump on a hand grenade here. Your obligation is to protect yourself and save yourself. And um, 
I think that's the situation Jean Valjean was in. Um, he could have just sat on the street and died because nobody cared about him, but he decided to live, and in order to live, he broke a window. And for breaking a window, he got sentenced to, what, life imprisonment or whatever, whatever the, the was that the Caf Castle Deef or whatever it was? I don't I forget what it was, but um, yeah. So those, those, those kinds of stories bring, bring the back, I mean, you're asking about criterion number nine, but um, there are people, uh, you know, uh, there are people who suffer disadvantage, and it seems to me that um, um, there, there's an obligation in thinking about punishment for attention to the disadvantage that people people suffer, um, does that affect the moral point of view? Well, um, it affects the the idea of impartial justice because the law is written to affect everybody who offends against this statute. All right, but um, um, it, it seems that there is some um, room that particular individuals can bring into their defense, I don't know how else to think about this, that the law should be taking account of, okay? Um, we, there needs to be some flexibility. The, the, the law says impartially, if you, if you offend against this, this is what the consequence um, will be. And usually there are some guidelines for it. It's not, um, you know, that you will, you know, in the United States, the laws are written, you could serve anywhere from, you know, four to 30 years for some kind of an offense, and, and the judge has discretion within a period like that. Um, um, and then there could be parole, and, and you could get early release, and there, there are all kinds of flexibilities around those kinds of things. And, some, and sometimes those things are actually written into the law. So there's, so is it impartial justice? Um, it means, you know, impartial justice is, is meant to be a fairness notion, okay? Um, and fairness means that we will take consideration of, um, of disadvantage. We do this around the idea of, um, um, well, we do this in, 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 uh, in, in, in different ways with different kinds of social policies. Um, we have a policy called affirmative action where um, um, the law says you can give, if we have historically underrepresented people applying for college, university, law school, med medical school, or jobs, that affirmative action means that you can give more attention to, say, a woman um, who comes from a disadvantaged group with respect to hiring, they're a majority group, but they're, they've received um, discrimination over the years, or Hispanics or blacks versus white males. And um, um, that's one of the programs that has allowed for our colleges and universities and for our corporate structures and everything else to, to, um, to um, diversify the populations. Is it fair? It is fair. I would argue that it's fair. It's not equal. It's not equal. And the challenges that come to it are coming from people who say it's not equal. I got higher scores on my college entrance exam than a black person who had lower scores and got into the college and I didn't get in. So we weren't treated equally. If the best score gets into the college, I should have gotten in and that person should not have. That's not how it works. Um, because um, fairness does not amount to equality. It amounts to equity. And equity plays, that's, we're playing with language here, but fairness um, is a different idea than equality. Um, sometimes to be fair, I need to give um, more advantage to a person who has been disadvantaged. So that's how that plays out. And that's all I'm saying in that criterion is that um, courts making decisions, judges making decisions need to be um, reasonable and they need to be sensitive. They need to know the law. They need to know discretion. They need to know the human heart a little bit. Okay, so other?
please. Yes. I have a question about uh, the nature of the wrong or justice, and uh, also about how how to know how we can know uh, what's wrong or, or what's just. But uh, first of all, uh, I must say that uh, I like very much uh, the idea of use a mixed moral theory. I think that uh, the moral life is very complex and uh, we have used many kinds of normative, uh, normative uh, principles or virtues. Uh, okay. And in this uh, approach of common agreement, as I understood it, uh, the notion, the notion uh, of justice is which reasonable people with good will yes. expect to affirm without controversy. Okay. But uh, my problem, uh, I, I, I didn't understand okay. the procedure, the details, the procedure for we uh, identify what reasonable reasonable people with good will will choose uh, without controversy. Well, my question is uh, how identify what uh, is the common moral agreement? In other words, how identify what's wrong or right or right is just inside the moral community. Well, uh, we have a procedure for do this job. Uh, I, I, I think, in, uh, I think in, in some examples, uh, Adam Smith in the theory of moral theory used a procedure uh, of a um, uh, impartial spectator. Okay. For example, you have a procedure of impartial spectator yeah. that uh, he uh, can imagine uh, the resentment of the victim uh, caused by the offender. The offender. Uh, the impartial spectator can imagine the resentment of the victim. And then uh, this, this kind uh, of uh, normative yeah. criteria uh, serves as a ground to punishment, for example. In John Brown's theory of justice, we have a procedure of the original position, for example, uh, that represents a, a, a moral point of view, a common point of view. Uh, it's, uh, it's connected uh, about uh, a design for farming goods, and this base uh, is a ground to choose uh, the principles of justice. Okay. Equal yeah. liberty, for example, and so on. Right, right. Uh, right, right. In Thomas Scanlon, Thomas Scanlon, King Scanlon, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Right. another contra <laughs> It seems we have a, 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 a similar uh, procedure. And the wrong is determined, the wrong of the unjust, the active wrong is determined by a moral principle, and the moral principle is uh, uh, accepted by a common agreement in a negative way. We can uh, affirm uh, a, a principle, a moral principle uh, is accepted by a group, if people cannot reasonably reject the principle. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a procedure. Well, my question is, if I understood uh, correctly your approach, your common agreement approach, the basis for identifying the wrong would be the reactive attitudes, the emotions, like resentment, indignation, guilt, gratitude, and so on. The emotional response that you make to another people to act badly. But the emotional basis would not be so weak. We we can trust in this emotional basis. Uh, I, I think that in some cases the emotional basis can show a wrong direction. 
Okay. Uh, okay. No, I let, let me give you one, okay. one example. Okay. Uh, Oscar White. Oscar White was a bright famous writer yes. in the ninth century. Uh, he was found guilty uh, and sentenced to two years right. in prison with hard labor. Hard labor. Yeah. Right, right, right. For carrying out homosexual acts yeah. who, uh, uh, with several boys in the year of uh, 1895, mm -hmm. in the end of 97. The question arises as to whether homosexuality can, in fact, be classified as a form of moral wrongdoing and the of crime. That's the question. <laughs> there would be or not a certain arbitrariness in determining uh, what counts as a crime, as a well, a wrong, uh, uh, as a moral wrong. There were a common agreement, there were, there were a common agreement in the 9th century, in 1895, right. uh, about homosexuality is wrong, was wrong, is wrong, and crime. But not nowadays, in present times, we, we disagree about uh, thinking of yes. sexuality, homosexuality as a moral wrong or even a crime. Uh, well, it, it seems important uh, to me because your second criteria of just punishment, mm -hmm. the second criteria, you said there must be a just cause for a punishment. Just cause. Just cause is cause just, or cause right, a right cause. Uh, and then uh, just cause. And if the just cause is, uh, cause is determined by a common agreement, this approach could not imply a arbitrariness, a liberty, <laughs> arbitrariness. Mm. Well, there's a, an awful lot in what you ha have said here, um, and um, I will accept as a criticism the idea that um, um, this is just a formal statement. There must be a just cause for inflicting a punishment. What if something at one moment in time is considered to be um, a wrong that should be punished, some kind of um, offense against the no moral norms, okay? And at another time, society has changed and no longer considers that to be the case. Um, now, that's a, that's a provocative question. And all that's said here, I mean, you're right. It's, um, it, it is not specifying anything. And would this just punishment have justified, could it have been used to justify the imprisonment of Oscar Wilde? And I will say to you, I think it was used to justify Oscar Wilde, um, uh, an idea like this. In the time and society in which he was living, um, it, um, homosexuality was, a, um, was illegal and it was a moral offense. Okay, it was both of those things. They, okay, um, there must be a just cause for inflicting a punishment and the society believed it had it, okay? What I hope the theory also shows is by not specifying things, um, you know, it's not like I'm going to list 20 crimes here, okay? By not specifying things and keeping it formal, it opens things up to um, ideas like moral evolution and, and change over time. This may not be a great answer to your question, um, uh, but the, but the fact is that um, um, we look back on Oscar Wilde right now. We make movies about him. There have been movies about his trial. And, uh, and um, we feel in society, at least many people do, a, a great deal of sympathy for what happened to him. And we can talk about the injustice of, of what happened. Um, we can. These are, the, these are the realities of um, moral life, that um, the, the principles that we hold fast to are distinct, I think, from the realities 
of how we view things through the, eye, the, through the eyes of our, our cultures, the times we live in, the, um, the degree of moral pr progress that we have reached. Um, so all of those things um, come into play. And, um, you know, when Thomas Aquinas was doing natural law, um, natural law, as, as, as you may know, plays a huge role in the Roman Catholic Church. And um, natural law in the Roman Catholic Church often is presented around ideas of sexuality. And one of the condemnations of homosexuality in the Catholic Church is that it violates natural law by which it, which it means that the, the licit, the allowable and morally legal um, um, context or idea of, a, of, of sexual activity needs to be around the idea of procreation. Okay, well, um, if you're a homosexuality, if you're, if you're a homosexual, if you're a gay person or a lesbian, you engage in sexual activity without any prospect of procreating. Therefore, it's wrong. Why? It's unnatural. Because our idea of natural means that a male and a female should get together for unitive um, and procreative purposes, as, as Humana Vita said. It's procreative and there's a unitive part, so there's some pleasure involved, so enjoy the pleasure. But, it, it's, but sexual activity needs to be directed around um, the idea of procreation, okay? Well, here we are. I mean, um, Pope John, or Pope Paul VI reaffirmed that doctrine back in 65 or something, whenever that was, Pope, yeah. And um, here we are uh, 45 years later, and society has a different view of, of homosexuality. Um, does everyone know? And the church teaching has not changed on this. So many Roman Catholics who are um, faithful to the church may still hold to this idea. But we do know that in many places, ideas have changed, okay? Because, to go back to the natural law thing, um, we have different ideas as to what is natural. What if that old understanding that male and female and procreation is the only legitimate context for sexual contact and activity, um, what if that um, is no longer considered natural? What if it's the case that God made people homosexual? See, that was something that was never considered. If what if a person is born um, with a proclivity um, so that their nature is actually directed towards um, same-sex relations. That's something, see the idea was that if you were directed towards same-sex, that was a perversity, that you were doing this for perverse reasons. We talked about perversity yesterday, right? That you're doing this for perverse reasons. Well, what if the understanding now is, as no, it's not perversity. There are some people kind of born to be gay. There's something in the makeup. Um, there have been different theories about that. But um, it's not like, I think the one thing that has been kind of discounted in modern discussions of this is the idea that you just choose to be a homosexual or something. And um, if, if you are gay or you know somebody who's gay, I'll bet that's not what the response is. People don't know, I'm, I'm a gay person. And um, um, I, I didn't choose this. This is who I am. And they're saying this is my nature, right? So, so the attack here is actually on the idea of what counts as natural and what is our... So if that idea comes under um, evaluation, there could be changes in our moral views about these behaviors. So, you know, 50 years ago, we could have, we condemn homosexuality because it violates um, our idea of what is natural. Um, and even, actually, back even then, there was, 
this was not all you know accepted everywhere but but if we challenge the idea that you that everybody everybody is born heterosexual and those who are homosexual are that way because of personal perversity that's a different understanding than what we have today that that science has um, offered some different explanations for the behavior should that change our moral view you know because one of the things you're asking is how, how is it that we come about having changes in our moral views about things and sometimes it's like this that an idea we had um, no longer can be supported that it's being supported by very weak cultural explanations or something like that White supremacy is, you know, another idea that could be subjected to a criticism that um, these ideas came out of certain places and, and out of you know, some of the, I mean, even, even 19th century universities that set up racial distinctions, you know, and this was all generated from, from somewhere. And going back and challenging these ideas means that um, um, our moral views can actually change and they can evolve in light of changed understandings of things. So um, uh, this, is, this is a long way of getting at your question. I don't know how to do these things on a, in a short way, but, but um, you know, we, when we talk about um, there must be a just cause for punishment, um, a lot of people would today say that Oscar Wilde um, suffered a, a terrible fate, um, and it shortened his life. I mean, when he, he was released, he didn't live all that long after he left prison. It was a, a terrible thing that they, they put him through. Um, would he fare better in today's society? Well, it would depend on the society, you know, because there are still societies that frown on, on homosexuality. He would not fare well in like Iraq or something, or, or you know, in a, in a country that has very hostile attitudes towards, towards homosexuality. But he would, you know, in the United States, wouldn't pay attention to that. That wouldn't be an issue. There could be other issues that come up. Is he exploiting and coercing people into sexual activity? You know, those things are still under critique. Those things would still be looked at, but his nature wouldn't be um, criticized. Like, oh, you're a homosexual, you're a perverse person, you're evil. We should punish you for that. Um, that has changed. Is it a good thing that that's changed? I, yes. Um, there is such a thing as moral evolution. And as I said earlier, the fact that um, Brazil once had slaves, you don't have slaves now. Let's all agree that that's a good thing. Okay? So what happened? You know, you explain that to me, and I'll explain what happened in my country about that, and we can both agree on Oscar Wilde, you know, as well. Um, but changes do take place, in, and it doesn't mean that in the, I mean, you're, in the administration of things, um, well, maybe that's not, I don't want to go there, but, but it's the, um, uh, when we, can, can just cause be shown to be inadequate? in light of history, okay? And I would say yes, okay? It's a formal notion here. It's, um, it's empty of content. We fill in the content, the content can change. And that's a good thing that it changes. Um, the idea that moral evolution is going on should be some sign of hope for us, <laughs> that things will get better. Um, we have people, um, I don't know how, I have no idea how this is accepted across the world, but we do have American politicians who, um, who claim that there's no such thing as climate change, and they run for office on that. And I think that's really dangerous that we put people like that in positions of power, because I think the scientific evidence on that's pretty clear. So I would say that moving from a place where people are saying climate change is not a problem to a place where people are saying we all agree it's a problem is going to be a good thing. Uh, but would a person have just cause? Um, you know, could, it's just a formal idea. And it, um, it needs content. 
and the content we put into it is subject to evaluation. And um, some people who, you know, 50 years ago, we knew there was pollution, but we didn't see it as some kind of huge problem in the world. I mean, it, we were starting to become aware of it. Um, my goodness, um, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, back in the 1960s, a, a river started on fire, the Cuyahoga River. I'm, I'm, my home is near there. And it's not that I saw it or anything, but um, there are songs. Randy Newman wrote a song about that. You know, like, Burn on, big river. The Lord can make you tumble. The Lord can make you turn. The Lord can make you overflow but the Lord can't make you burn, you know? Um, so we, we knew about um, um, pollution problems and all that, but now they're saying if we don't do something in the next 11 years, um, we're doomed. You know, humanity is gonna be facing some enormous, insurmountable problems with, with climate issues. So is it gonna be a good thing if we get things oh. moved there? Uh, yeah. It is. Um, and, and we can look back historically and see failures, and um, we, we, we need to move things, move things along. Moral evolution is, is a reality. When we're caught in the moment, we apply the standard of the moment. Okay, so 50 years ago, we would have done this. Maybe 150 years ago, we'd all be white supremacists if we're white and um, look down on other races. Well, we can't do that today because there's been an evolutionary move in our understanding and all that. And that's all to the good, okay? So when, when we deal, I mean, these, that's a great question you're raising. And, and I would just say again that um, the, the thing about a theory like this, um, it's one of the things that can leave people unsatisfied is that it is kind of formal. It's just ideas that are relevant to the idea of justice, but there's no content to it because we have to supply the content. And, um, you know, um, uh, 200 years ago in the United States, if we got together to talk about slavery around some kind of notion, if there was some, you know, progressive liberal mind saying, you know, slavery is wrong, as I would not be a slave, I would not be a master, and that person would have gotten voted down by all the people who support slavery. So the formal observance of the norms of the day would win out, and now we're caught up with the guy who says, as I would not be a slave, I would not be a master. Change takes place. Moral change takes place in our understanding of how the norms work, but we need some guidance on what um, sets the agenda for our, our topical conversations, and the content will change. Um, that's what I have to, that's what I think. That, uh, maybe I didn't get at all what you're, you're, you're raising there, but um, I, I'm, I'm taking the criticism of the, of the criterion seriously, at least I hope I am. So I appreciate that. So, oh, I, gosh, I'm sorry, we're, we're running a little bit over. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to keep you. Um, geez, um, I'll let you go five minutes early tomorrow. How's that? Uh, Um, uh, let me think here. Um, but, uh, da, 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 da. Well, you know what I would appreciate um, tomorrow. Um, da, 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 da. There's an article of. Well, I don't know. Since we're cutting things short, um, we're not having a fifth day. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to talk about is the moral education theory. Just a, it's just a it's just a different um, perspective on the issue, um, and um, actually this wasn't even a required thing. But I have a little article on on forgiveness as relatedness. It's only like five or six pages long. Um, it's in class number five. You might want to take a look at that. But what what I would encourage you to do um, since tomorrow will be kind of a it will be our last time together. Maybe we can wrap this up, but if there are issues that we haven't gotten to that you came in here wanting to address, bring them in. Um, we haven't talked much about forgiveness. We haven't, uh, I actually, I wanted to talk about the, um, um, geez, I'm giving you more stuff to do then. Um, I actually wanted to talk about the, uh, the Albert Dezur, D-Z-U-R, about um, restorative justice. 
And I think that's maybe where I'll start tomorrow because I do want to, this is a different model of punishment um, and response to punishment. And um, um, if you get to these other things, that's fine. If not, but, but maybe we should really, we do want to give attention to restorative justice in, in here and, and get that opened up as a, as a concern. Because all these things about apologies and forgiveness and reconciliation, um, as an alternative to retribution, um, I, I think is an important um, thing to do. So, is that all right to do that? Bring in your questions, um, and we'll we'll um, we'll go wherever you want to go. We can we can keep it kind of freewheeling. Um, I, I appreciate the questions that you you have asked and, and, and brought to the fore. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah.